I'm Justin. I'm Kay. I'm Nolan. I'm Corey. I'm Jamie. I'm Marius. And, and this, this is Comic Verse. Welcome to another Comic Verse podcast. The subject of today's podcast is X Men the Dream. What is the X Men metaphor? We're going to discuss uh, the differing ideologies of various X Men characters and factions, including their real world parallels and how analogous they are to struggles of the minorities and people like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. As always, I'm your host, Comics First CEO, Justin Alba, and I'm so thrilled to be co-hosting a second podcast with one of my favorite people on the planet Earth and beyond, Comics First writer and X-Men expert all the way from Dortmund, Germany. Did I pronounce that right? Maris? Yeah, you did. In yes. Fact. Oh, thank you. I've been, I've been practicing my German. Mm, good. Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> anyway, that my co-host is Mary Esteen and Kampf. Hey, Justin. How are you? I'm really good, Justin. I'm really excited to be co-hosting this podcast, and I think it's a great honor to be co-hosting with you on oh, your thank birthday. You. Thank Woo! you. Oh, um, is. Yeah, we had such a good time. Uh, he co-hosted the Chris Claremont podcast with me, and at one point it was just me, Marius, and Chris Claremont. Yeah. It was pretty fun. So, Marius, you were pretty excited about today's episode, so why don't you tell us about your background and uh, relationship with philosophy, because we're going to be discussing a lot of philosophy and stuff today, so that was why you were excited, right? Yeah, right. That's one of the reasons. I think that uh, today's episode is really, like, we're going to get a lot into the different ideologies and the different concepts and dreams. And I think even though it's kind of theoretical, I do think it's extremely interesting to talk about and has really much much potential. So um, my background of philosophy is that uh, I've always been interested in philosophy in school, but also as, like, a hobby of mine. And I'm probably going to study something philosophy-esque. I'm not sure yet about the specifics, but I probably want to uh, be a philosophy and English teacher in the future. So we'll see about that. Um, and it's always been a topic, especially ethics, that was like really, I don't know, appealing to me. So I'm really looking forward to uh, getting into like an in-depth discussion today. Awesome. Is there a lot of ethics in X-Men? Uh, I do think so, yes. Cool. I feel like every episode I start by saying how this is a special episode, but we've never done a podcast on my birthday before. We never did Yay! a podcast after. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So cool. Never did a podcast Happy after birthday. interviewing. Thank you. Uh, never did a podcast after interviewing Chris Claremont before. And I can honestly say I've never been so excited to celebrate my birthday with some of my new friends and Aww. coworkers. So I'm like really excited. I couldn't have thought of a better way to spend this. It's true. I have no friends left, but either way, I would have sat by myself watching old episodes episodes of Mad Men and cried about how old I was and pretended I was Betty Draper and died. This is uh, much better than that. And uh, Instead, that's you're going to do it with everyone. Exactly. <laughs> I'm so excited. No, but seriously, I'm on a serious note. Seriously, seriously, thank you very much. I feel like Al Gore and like seriously, like seriously, I'm yeah. so super serious. Man Bear Pig is coming. Anyway, I'm very serious that that I'm excited that you guys are here. But before we get into today's podcast, do check us out on comicsfirst.com. We have tons of articles, interviews, videos, and more. There's podcasts just like this one. And again, that's comicsfirst.com. Joining us today as panelists are Comics First Managing Editor, Ms. Jamie Rice. Jamie, join us on the Claremont interview. How are you doing, Jamie? And how did you enjoy the Claremont interview experience? I'm doing very well. And the Claremont interview was amazing. There was a moment where me and Chris Claremont both gave a moment of poignant, tear-filled silence for Jean Grey. And I think that was one of the best moments of my life. So I would say it went really well. Nice, nice. So next up is comics first writer, actor, screenwriter, and filmmaker, Corey Spanner. How are you doing, Corey? Woo-hoo! I'm amazing. All right, it's amazing. And I get to talk about the X-Men. Awesome. And it, it, like, if you were an X-Men title, you would be amazing X-Men, I feel. Aww. Aww. Thank you. You're very welcome, yeah. I would, I would be um, like X-Men The End. I don't know why I just feel like I would be. I kind of right. see that, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah, not in a yeah. I think that's appropriate. Marius would be like all new X Men. Nolan would be the Dark Phoenix Saga. <laughs> why? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> just because I thought it was just a funny. No, Jamie, you would be like the King he's Pride da- coming back and astonishing. He's Pride. like Dark Phoenix Saga when he's drunk. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Anyway, I do advise everyone to go to comicsverse.com and uh, search for Dirk Manning, who co-wrote Tales of Mystery, and check out Corey's interview at Wizard World Cleveland, which was absolutely awesome and one of our best interviews. Uh, also joining me is Comics First writer, artist, webcomic artist, interviewer. What do you not do, Kay Honda? What do you not do? I, uh, lots of things, I think. <laughs> I'm not good at being a person. You're pretty good at being a person. That's, that's silly. Right? Isn't that silly, Jamie? She's perfect. 
I'm yeah, not right. good at being nice. You're perfect just the way you are. Do 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 do. No one knows that song either. Okay, just fuck. <laughs> can kill me I now. Know it. Be a <laughs> long <laughs> fuck. You just, then you just left him hanging. That's even more dick, I feel. He needs to sing really a song. Rude. I'll let him sing the song. Thank you. Thank you. Speaking of, of, of Nolan, I was going to call you X-Men comics expert and Columbia University PhD student studying the Ming Dynasty. But I always forget when I write scripts, is it the second half? First half of the first Ming Dynasty. Half. First century. Damn it. Okay. Yeah, also, there's... he's the original Cyclops hater. I hate yeah. Cyclops. Also, most uh, China historians study the latter half of the Ming Dynasty. Okay. That's what distinguishes so me is that I studied mm. the earlier half of it. Awesome. Cool. I, I, will, I promise I will remember that one of these times. And I'm excited for you to go all anarchist on this stuff today because we need an anarchist know, on the some panel. Radical opinions on this. Right. Stuff. Mm. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, we'll see. He's sitting quite radically right now. I know. No, no. Very radically. You're man spreading and not showing your face. There's only three of us. Man so spreading is fine. I was man spreading too, but it's by accident because I have no, I'm so big it just has to spread somewhere. All right. So let's start with a simple question. I think Marius would be a good place to start with this. Yes. Marius, who are the X Men and what is the X Men comic series, family of comics, all about? I think the X Men are a big family of people who are being discriminated against unfortunately and who've sworn to protect a world that fears and hates them and it's a comic book about values such as egalitarianism but also i don't know compassion friendship love would you argue family yeah family definitely jamie how about you you're my protege you are you are the gene gray to my xavier because i wanted you to become an x-men fan and look what happened i know look where we are now <laughs> right well year later which is crazy. I feel like it's like your birthday and it's also like almost like the first year birthday of like comics first. Right. Me and you. Yeah. 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 That's so, That's true. so lovely. Aww. I think X-Men for me has always been about acceptance in any form. So an acceptance from friends or peers or family. And I think I liked that Mary's kind of emphasized the love angle. I think that it's about finding a group of people who support you and then trying to Give that support to others. I think at the most basic level, that's the that's the story. Oh, okay. You came to X Men through one of my favorite windows. Yes, Emma, Emma Frost. Ah, oh. oh, girl, slay. She's we have such so mutual good. love for her. We have such mutual She's, love for her. Yeah, I have to thank you because I always knew about X Men, but you're right. That was the window that I was introduced into X Men and the whole world of it. And just to go off of what Jamie was saying, I feel like it's super appropriate that this podcast is on your birthday and it's about X-Men and we're going into kind of the philosophy or like the ideologies of it because just to, you know, like in terms of family and stuff, I think that that's, you even said really early on when I joined the around, wow, like almost a year now, yeah, yeah a year ago, last July. Uh, when I was just an intern, you were saying like, yeah, you should feel like, I want you to feel like this is like the X-Men where you like feel safe and it's like, you know, everyone cares about each other and it's a family. Like, we all have to do work and get work done, but it's a family. And I was just like, <laughs> and there were tears. It was on this balcony right here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. very beautiful. But, yeah, so I'm excited to talk about that. And it's the most, like, the stars are aligning for this to happen. Right, And this is kind of what we do. This is what we always wanted to do and always wanted to talk about these yeah, um, that's true. types of issues and, and types of things. So I'm excited that we'll be talking about them, too. Corey, so the question was, who are the X-Men? What is this comic about? To me, the X-Men have always been about embracing who you are, no matter what. Deciding who you are, figuring that out at a certain point in your life. And when the world says you're supposed to be one way, you embrace the other way. Love it. Nolan, how about you? Because you've been reading X-Men a long time. I've always thought that the X-Men are just a really entertaining, great group uh, superhero comic. But in the context of this podcast, I will assume my role of Magneto. And I will say that the X-Men are reformists whose job it is to avoid the label of terrorism at all costs. Cool. Huh. <laughs> ha! Ha! <laughs> On um, that note. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, but okay, so we've all read a ton of X-Men comics, and obviously we prepared by reading a lot today that dealt with race and gender, sexuality, inequality, etc. But what are the X-Men moments for each of us, or, or the facets that correlate to real-world situations for each of you, whether that's personally or something that you're passionate about no one doesn't ask you first but you look like you're in, in thinking about it all right uh does anyone have an answer first i mean can it be i don't can it be kind of general sure 
just because I was thinking about the thing that I li- really like about X Men and the comics that we read for today was it wasn't just mutants versus people, which is really easy to do, especially in light of all the films that are coming out, because uh, for the sake of the films and storytelling in the films, you kind of have to, or not have to, but it's advisable to make distinct us versus them narratives just because for movies, that's great. But with comics, you can definitely make it more complicated than that. And not only is it complicated in that there's no strict like us versus them, but there's also like the Morlocks and there's also just like different sects of or like or different groups that have their own reasons for feeling isolated or feeling like they don't belong. And I thought that that was always really cool just because, you know, even if Charles and Magneto didn't always see eye to eye, like there were different ideologies within within the mutant community in terms of like how to go about, you know, dealing with any adversity they might have in among humans. And then there's also humans who, you know, like there's that one, that one woman who didn't even realize she was a mutant, but she like was giving all her, I forgot the title of the, it's like God loves what man kills or something yeah, like that. Yeah. God loves what kills. Yeah. Yeah. And the woman is like this faithful person to the reverend and she becomes a mutant, but she's like, it doesn't even, ma- it almost doesn't matter to her that she's immune. She's like, but I believed all this for you. Like I did this, this whole belief system, like doesn't that mean anything? And, you know, the Reverend represents this kind of black and white attitude of like, no, you're a mutant. So it's just no. And I thought that X-Men, like just as a series or a group, always does a really good job of complicating that line. And do you think those complications are a mirror for... The real life issues. Right. Well, I think that that's why X-Men has continued to survive and be really popular. And because it's so believable, it's not it's you don't just read it thinking, oh, this is a superhero story. Like, it's really easy to do that with comics. But with X-Men, it's always facing very important issues that have always been in uh, have always been a problem, continue to be a problem and will probably be a problem for, you know, our lifespan there's no there's no utopia there's never going to be able to be a perfect solution so i think that in that infinite like not infinite problem but this infinite conflict is very much parallel to how our world is too so i like that i have to say i agree very much with what you're going to say uh does anybody want to chime in uh yeah talking about how uh these facets of the x-men correlate to real world problems i've been thinking a lot lately about how uh well i should say that I've always viewed X-Men as kind of like an allegory for like gay rights and acceptance and things like that. And I've always really dug that. But recently I've been taking a class that talks about representations of terrorism in media. And Mm -hmm. I've really Mm -hmm. studied the X-Men in that way. And I think the thing that's really stuck out to me is how it's almost a mirror to American society and the absurdity of how we generalize all these threats. Like X2 came out right after 9-11. Mm. and Nightcrawler attacks the White House, and the first thing the government does is wrangle up all the mutants. And that is such a mirror for how the government acted after 9-11. And there were so many great moments because we saw that that mutants at the school were just a bunch of kids, and Wolverine and Iceman were sitting there in the kitchen, and then they were attacked by Stryker's task force. And it's moments like that that are in almost all of the X-Men comics that mirror our society so perfectly. Mm -hmm. And I think that is what makes it so important. And I know we're going to talk about um, the state of Americans, uh, American Muslim relations later and how X-Men touches upon that. Marius, how about you? I think it's funny that you mentioned X2 because I was just going to mention like another scene from that movie, which is probably what many people think of first when they think about like the X-Men as an analogy to gay rights. It's like uh, the scene in which uh, Iceman is talking to his parents, coming out to his parents mm-hmm. basically about him being a mutant and which is like so iconic his mother's like have you ever tried not being a mutant and it's just like that's just a hundred percent like the perfect analogy for that so that's a moment i'm really really passionate about because it points out on screen with like a massive mainstream audience how like superhero comics but uh and uh, superhero comic book movies can address like these really sensible topics of discussions in like really appropriate way way i guess and Yeah, I mean, that's like one of the moments I I was passionate about. The X-Men do what science fiction does really well, which is that they allegorize a contemporary situation Mm -hmm. using unbelievable examples that can be safely considered by everyone. So even people who think that Muslims should be oppressed or that homosexuals should be oppressed 
today can get something out of the X-Men and have like a door omen for them in which mm-hmm. they like might actually think about the subject position of these oppressed people. Jamie, do you have anything to add? I do. Just kind of going back to your question about if we had a personal connection with the X-Men. I've always felt, I haven't read as many comics, but I've seen obviously Mystique a lot in all the films. And I've always really enjoyed kind of her perspective about the way she looks and how people are kind of herself and other people included are always like, why don't you just kind of cover your mutation all the time? And I'm always interested in the fact that some mutations are coverable and others aren't. I think that's pretty analogous to a lot of different like types of like either sexuality or race or gender. But I always think that I would say it's like one of those things where it works really well as a metaphor and it also works really well internally for anyone. Like you can apply that to just like, I feel like I don't like the way I look where you could also apply it to, I feel like my identity is completely different and I could cover it all the time or I could just be it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one of my things that I've always enjoyed the most about X-Men is that it really encourages people to be themselves but also at the same time it doesn't say like oh you'll just be yourself it's not and it'll just work out and everyone's just gonna be like you look great Mm -hmm. so i think it's like nice in the sense that it encourages you to be yourself and it's like it's hard to be yourself but you have to try because what else are you going to do and it's a great outlook like just a general metaphor for any difference is i think yeah so i that's i'm sorry that was completely redundant to what jamie was saying but i was like getting on board with what she was saying like yeah no i, I felt the Fight same the way power. Yeah. yes i would say i jamie I actually forgot about personal moments and i wasn't going to answer the question but i remember i was in therapy once maybe like six months ago and i used x23 in a sense lost at the beginning of oh my God. um the f- at beginning of x-force volume two to describe like how depressed i was because there's a moment in x-force i think it's vo- i want to say it's volume two where the team is Warpath, X-23, mm-hmm. Wolverine. Uh, I don't know, Marius, if you read it when it first started. I think you read Uncanny X-Force, if I remember. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I did. And there's a moment where Rain is an X-Force, and I think she's about to go crazy. They they have her on heroin, and we find out, spoiler alert, that Reverend Craig is her father for those New Mutants people, we, which we didn't know then. And she goes, and, and she attacks someone, but... but X-23 takes her out and Wolverine yells at her and, and he says, Rain is the kind of person that we need to save. So they end up shackling her and she escapes and X-23 is the only one there and instead of fighting her back, her, she withdraws her claws and basically lets Rain almost kill her because she took what he said so seriously to the fact that her self-esteem was so low that she didn't even feel like she could just basically defend herself. She took it that far as like that she wasn't even worth it to live and I think I'm believe me, I'm a much luckier human being than X23, and I never want to <laughs> make that be a parallel for my life. But I can definitely empathize with how she felt, and I think a lot of people can uh, mm-hmm. with that moment. So, can we each pick a character or, or storyline in X Men and talk about that character's journey or, or the journey of of an ensemble in that storyline, mm-hmm. and talk about what it might be a metaphor of? And I know this is like right off the cuff, so if we need a second to think about it, that's totally okay. I. You have one. Yeah. Go. Magneto. Of course. Yeah. I mean, uh, Magneto's story right from the beginning was envisioned by Jewish American authors as the kind of dark side of a Jewish diaspora reaction to the Holocaust, Mm. Uh, a side that should, uh, an example that should not be followed. But at the same time, his reaction is the reaction of almost all real terrorists in the world, which are almost Mm -hmm. all people who have been tortured by state regimes and who afterward engage in radically violent resistance to state regimes. Not always the same state that tortured them, but as they see it. The state that sponsored their torture. And Magneto's position in X-Men for the last 30 years is meant to be sympathetic, of course, because he weaves back and forth between anti-villain and villain, anti-hero and villain. So uh, we're meant to always think of him as like the the uh, what Xavier would have been if Xavier didn't have good friends, a comfortable childhood, this and that. You know, so in that sense, it's like the it's like the template on which we can all map a kind of materialist sense of why terrorism happens that has been endorsed by everyone from Niall Ferguson, the famous conservative British historian, to the host of the remake of Cosmos. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah, who said in a fame in a atheist conference that the only reason that they don't uh, use tanks and planes in the uh, that the only reason that ISIS and uh, Al Qaeda don't use tanks and planes and use suicide bombers instead is that they can't afford tanks and planes. Otherwise, they would. And um, I mean, I think this is the very like the very calculus behind Magneto's behavior. 
Cool. I mean, for me, I would say X23, and I feel like I already answered that, but I definitely feel a connection to her journey from complete <laughs> lack of utter self-esteem or, or sense of self and feeling below everybody else and her inferiority complex and probably having issues with her anger to you know coming to a place where she learns to accept herself at the end of Innocence mm-hmm. Lost and eventually leaves X-Force and you know now we see her in All New Wolverine which both Marius and Corey have covered and she's, she's doing a lot better so yeah, she's great. yeah so kudos to X-23 and myself too so I don't want people to think it was that dark it wasn't but I just I empathize with it. Uh, anybody else want to go? Actually, it just to, I oh, just wanted to add on to something that you sure. said. I didn't even have any an answer for myself. Sure, we'll do for, K, Jamie, Marius. But for the X-23 thing, it's interesting because I don't necessarily, I like her as a character, but it's really interesting to hear you say that you relate to her because she, to me, what's really tragic about it is that from what you were saying about her low self-esteem, that's that totally comes from the fact that she was born out of function more than anything right. first. Like she wasn't born because anyone wanted her or like anything like that, which in a weird way, if you want to get really deep about it, nobody is born on purpose, you know, like all that right. stuff. So she was born for like this one purpose. Right. So she's denied all this, like kind of figuring out what her, at first she's denied. She's denied intimacy from her mother. Yeah. Stuff. She's yeah. denied anything that is remotely human and again like she has developed into this like three-dimensional or she was always always a three-dimensional character but she was we have seen her kind of develop into her own being which is really nice but for me i personally actually after reading the comics for this podcast actually feel a lot more strongly about kitty pride than i did before because I did not see all that stuff or like I didn't see her development coming for some Mm. reason. Not because she's not a good character that she, you know, because she was always a good character and I always liked her. But I just never imagined to what lengths she would develop into like she or how deeply she would end up caring and how much work she would put in. And I don't know. I thought that that was really great of her because in the in the end, you see that she ends up in like the whole office and you're just like, oh. Yeah, Marius and I have some news from the Claremont interview about X-Men The End we'll get to later. Oh, yeah. oh God. Okay, but anyway. <laughs> uh, Jamie. Going back to the metaphor question, I was trying to think of, I was thinking about Emma and how I loved her and I was trying to figure out what her metaphor was. And so I think there's a lot of things, but bear with me. So of course, Emma can read minds. And so I think that in some ways that could be a metaphor for the fact that you know whenever you have a certain identity difference, the way that society thinks about you. So I feel like whenever, so it makes you inherently not trust anyone because you just assume slash know that they think these things about you, which is why you keep people at a distance. So I would say that I enjoy Emma a lot because I think that she really exemplifies the fact that when you know that people are probably going to judge you, you just decide to shut down. And I think that's one of the main reasons why she usually tends to be on the Magneto side of the equation and not the Xavier side. Marius, how about you? I feel like I would pick a storyline rather than a character. And I would probably pick God Lost Man Kills because I just think it's like a timeless masterpiece. And I don't know. What I always enjoyed is that Striker, in a way, is one of the most powerful X-Men villains, despite him not having like any physical powers, any mutation or what whatsoever. What makes him so dangerous is like how he can be a racist demagogue and how he can create this huge, huge, massive amount of hatred against uh, the group of mutants like just by doing his public speeches, just by instrumentalizing his uh, religion. And yeah, he's a um, dictator. I feel like the final conflict between the X-Men and between Striker is just so powerful because they don't get to defeat him with weapons. They get to defeat him with words. And mm-hmm. it's just so powerful because it's just saying so much about like how we, like in a real-life situation, should deal with those kinds of demagogues like mm. by using words as our weapons mm. against hatred, against uh, discrimination, against, well, this kind of like instrumentalized religion. I think that's really beautiful, Marius. That was really beautiful. Yeah, very yeah. well said. Uh, Corey, do you have a character or a storyline? Yeah, I was trying to think because my favorite X-Men character, love him or hate him, I know he's a hot topic of debate, is Cyclops. Oh. Mm. And I've, uh, oh. I've always tried to pinpoint why I love him so much. And I think in a lot of ways, uh, Cyclops and Scott's journey is about reaching the bar that you set for yourself in life because Mm. we've seen that we've seen Scott 
honestly grow from being a boy to being a man in a lot of ways and reaching his destiny. And beyond that, it's about coming out from under the shadow of your father and those above you and Charles Xavier, because especially in recent years, you know, for better or worse, we've seen Scott become his own man and really come out from underneath of Xavier. Instead of being Xavier's pupil, he's really become Scott. That's actually really interesting, if right. if I may, Corey, because as someone who initially, like I still, it's so funny because we talked about this for Age of Apocalypse as well, but I, initially I wasn't, it's so easy to shit all over <laughs> Cyclops just because it's really easy to be like, oh, like you're just a Boy Scout because in certain permutations, he is, like that's what he is. He is top student, top boy, whatever, but it's interesting because we see a different side of him in Age of Apocalypse and then also in this for the reading and for this podcast because you see not only that, you know, where he came from as like a leader, but also where he went and how he defined himself away from Charles and the mistakes that he made and him having to deal with those mistakes and having to answer to those mistakes and, you know, you know, love him or hate him, exactly. Like he still stands by what he does which is really admirable and that was when i first like that's when i finally got it where it's like yeah you don't have to like him but he makes really difficult decisions and makes a lot of difficult calls and ends up you know like even at the end of it when he's talking to havoc and his he's talking to his brother he's just like you know, who who say like what was the revolution even about he was like i had no other choice nothing right. else was working and you can tell that there's a lot of regret there but it's like in a lot of ways, it made me sympathize a lot more about that kind of Boy Scout element to him because he's just trying to do the right thing. And when he said that, it sounded so much like a boy backed into a corner being like, I hit him because I don't know. I got frustrated and I don't know. And that's also kind of like he revealed his need, as we say. Yeah. And that was really that was a lot for me. And I think that I remember that so vividly because you can see that he has like this moment of just like, I didn't have a choice. That's I never thought you would ever say anything right. that positive about Cyclops. Yeah, it I was think, really intense. Yeah. I, I still don't like Jean, but <laughs> we're, we're, we're uh, no, but it, yeah. yeah, we'll work on it. We'll, we'll work on it. Yeah, we'll totally work on it. Obviously, not obviously, but Stanley discussed the differences between Magneto and Professor X as being similar and paralleling the differences between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. Mm hmm. I had a friend from Slovakia, and she had no idea what I was talking about. And she was like, oh, to me, they're kind of like Hitler and Stalin. Oh, and I was like, damn. Yeah, which damn. Which one is which? Oh, yeah. she, she thought uh, Magneto was like Hitler, and uh, the other one was like Stalin. I and see that. Was like Stalin. Yeah. I kind of uh, see that, though. Do you? Really can you, can you yeah, I don't see that. Yeah, well, I don't. I see that in the sense that I, se I see it in the sense that in the most general sense, I think that it's really easy to see like Charles and Magneto as, you know, like just differences like on one on each side but that's not necessarily wrong but you have to think of it as they're just like it's a spectrum it's a spectrum between these two poles and even they go up and down between the spectrum and i feel like charles and magneto have set up these weird personas of themselves that are like symbolic of kind of this intense pole or this intense side but in reality we, we see that they struggle through this spectrum all the time being like I don't know maybe you're right and you know it depends so it's really interesting because in that sense I see what she's saying because they like Charles and Magneto are almost just ideas and it's really easy to just think of them as ideas but and the same way that you when you hear Hitler or Stalin, you think of what they did and their ideologies, not them. Because at the end that's of the such day, a good point, Hitler say. Hitler was a painter initially. Like that's what he was. He was just a sensitive painter. A really sensitive painter. Yeah. But like you know what I'm saying? And then he was also notably charismatic and that's right. why people listen to him. But that's why it's so interesting because Hitler, we think Hitler, like just what we associate with Hitler, but we don't know what kind of, like, we don't know him. We, we never don't think met about him. the ideology. We never met him. We don't know. So that's just, so I get that. Marius, so what were you going to say? I feel like the Hitler and Magneto comparison was like a lot of, a lot more like understandable than the Stalin and, uh, and Charles comparison. Like, I feel like in some scenes or in some like takes on the character, I could feel like people would want to compare him to Hitler. For example, like, I don't know if you remember, like, from everyone's least favorite X-Men movie, X-Men The Last Stand, where he's basically standing in the forest and kind of 
I don't know, mobilizing like a lot of mutants for his mm -hmm. attack on Alcatraz. And he's like, yeah, we're the superior race. We are the cure. And I don't mm -hmm. know. I feel like that kind of portrayal, I don't know. It's kind of like the irony behind like a Holocaust survivor becoming yeah. like a literal mutant Hitler. It's kind of interesting, but then again, I don't think that like the 616 uh, Magneto from the comic books is like that because I don't know the way he was portrayed in uh, Grant Morrison's new X Men run could mm. be more similar to that. Right. But then we found was, out it was Zorn, right? Like, so yeah, yeah. It turned out later, uh, it wasn't like even, yeah, mm -hmm. after Morrison was gone, that there was Zorn. So uh, that doesn't really count. I don't think that. <laughs> He's as, I don't know, I think that his hatred against humans is like a lot more emotional and rooted within the character. It's not like, I don't think it's completely rooted in his ideology, mm. but I don't think we can compare him like to what Hitler has done. Like, uh, just as Kay has pointed out, uh, we would all, always kind of like think of Hitler um, and yeah, immediately think of what he's done. And that's kind of why I don't think Stalin and uh, Charles are like comparable because, um, yeah. I mean, Charles has done some really, really straight up morally questionable stuff throughout the years, but he's not a mass murderer. So also like it kind of reminds me of Captain America in that one issue because it's kind of it's like the public face that you give to like the press and stuff like because or because Charles and Magneto put themselves out there as these like you know not even I don't want to say gods but like these as symbol like a symbol for their ideology but we know by what we have read when they're alone or when they're with someone intimate that that's not true so I guess even if it's not directly connected between like Charles and Stalin and Hitler and Magneto it's like that idea of just this is their the face that we see or like what people remember but we have no idea who they are behind that i will say just really quickly i think that there it depends on kind of the iteration of charles but i do think there could be yeah. some productivity with the stalin metaphor only in the sense that i feel like stalin was a massive manipulator of like a large swath mm. and so if you think of charles and he's definitely done some questionable stuff in that way with withholding information or giving too much of it so i would mm -hmm. say that there is it's not quite the same but i mean stalin and hitler kind of were on opposite sides and they did kind of have different approaches and stalin was definitely a background manipulator yeah so i will say there is some it's like a very jarring connection to make but i do think there is some productivity at least with that aspect mm. Uh, there's a comic that that does sort of tackle this question. It's a DC comic. It's a one-off, and it casts uh, Superman as the best possible Stalin that there could be. Uh, Stalin's inheritor, the man who takes over from Stalin, and it casts. Is it Red Sun? Yeah, Red Sun. Oh, okay. and it casts. Uh, most book, yeah. And it casts um, Lex Luthor as almost like a Trump figure, but yeah. Except Lex Luthor is so smart that he can run the American economy and turn it very prosperous, just as Superman can within his own super intelligent mind run the Soviet economy all as a planned economy and make it work very well. I don't find either Professor X or Magneto to be in these kinds of positions of like running a whole vast population in the way that... Well, Magneto had Genosha. That's true. I don't know what the population of Genosha was. 8 million? Was it 8 million who died, that died in... 16. 16, 16 million. million. I think... It, I think a better allegory for Magneto than Hitler or Malcolm X would be Ho Chi Minh. Malcolm X was not a proponent of the kind of Gandhi-inspired nonviolent resistance that Malcolm King, Martin Luther King, explicitly advocated. And he did, uh, you know, in some sense he defended violent resistance, but not to the extent that Magneto does in the comics and not to the extent that Ho Chi Minh did in real life. I mean, Ho Chi Minh is advocating for a independent Vietnamese nationalist state that can decide on its own political economic policy, which in his view should be socialism. He is resistant to the power structure of the world, NATO dominated, which Magneto also is. Magneto founds a country. And in addition... They just both have much more influence. I mean, unlike Hitler and Stalin, Magneto and Ho Chi Minh both travel in these liberal circles. Ho Chi Minh went to Paris. He participated in the Socialist Internationale okay. there. He interacted with many other people before he became the leader of this movement. Why? Well, while that's all valid, I think that I think in the most in the I mean in the most general sense, I think that what your friend was talking about, Justin, was kind of just like that dichotomous 
relationship of those ideologies, you know, and I think that you're right that if we were going to go for the individual that Magneto does totally, um, from what you're explaining, does relate more to Ho Chi Minh as like a leader. But I think in the most simplistic and general sense of, you know, unfortunately, just having that dichotomy, then that makes sense. Well, I gotta say, you will never catch me sticking up for Charles Xavier. I even told Chris Claremont yeah, as no, a kid. Yeah, no, he's not. Right. I even told, that, to say the least, I even told Claremont that as a kid, I wanted to be on Emma's Hellions and New Mutants. Yep. And he was like, he was like, no, you didn't. And I was like, right. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't tell me how to feel. <laughs> <laughs> no, Chris Claremont can definitely tell me how. He's been I know. That's how to, a, yeah. He's yeah, been that's telling exactly, me how to yeah. feel my whole life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he's been doing a pretty he's good job so one. far. He's right. the only one. Yeah. But uh, Brian Singer, when he took over the X Men films, or when he started the X Men films in 2000, he said he based Xavier a lot on Gandhi. I, of course, definitely don't see this, especially no. with the comic book version. I do not see this, given how she treated the AI danger, uh, or mm-hmm. he, how he treated the AI danger, given how uh, what he did with the second team of X Men in, uh, was it Deadly Genesis? And yeah, yeah. Um, yeah also given a, a few other things. So, does anyone see Gandhi in Xavier? Actually, Oh, Marius? Um, I think that it's kind of problematic how Charles Xavier is uh, generally treated as like this public figure of pacifism. But then again, like... He has a paramilitary group. Sorry? He has a paramilitary group the whole time. I was just going to say that. Like, that's kind of, even though I don't really like that, that's kind of the concept of uh, the X-Men. I mean, he's been, uh, he's been like inviting 16-year-old students to his mansion and basically well recruiting him for his private army of sorts so i don't know i feel like sometimes like a public face that kind of represents pacifism is definitely something that uh, we need or that could you know serve a, a purpose but i don't really i don't really see that working in in xavier's like in that case, I would say early Xavier might argue that he's forming this paramilitary team in order to stop other mutants who he who have different ideologies from committing atrocities in order for, you know, the greater good, which is to maintain the peace. And uh, remember, he doesn't kill. They don't kill. They, the X-Men don't kill until X-Force comes out, although mm-hmm. there's been exceptions, uh, most notably Storm. Marius. Yeah, I think I don't really I mean, depending on. Like the situation, I don't really see like a moral problem with that, but that's just not pacifism anymore. Right. So, well, I don't, I don't think the Gandhi like metaphor does really, really work here. I think it does. Why? Because yeah, well, just because again, I'm not an expert on Gandhi, so like that's just <laughs> that's my disclaimer before I your like, PhD <laughs> is not in Gandhi. Yeah, it's not in Gandhi or pacifism, and even in my own belief system isn't necessarily about like just pure pacifism but i think that again like what we were saying before about how it's easy to say like malcolm x and martin luther king and like associate these big names to charles and magneto especially their dichotomous relationship and ideologies similarly i think that charles character is actually just as it's similar, our understanding of Charles is similar to our understanding of Gandhi because Gandhi did do great things and he did promote pacifism. But at the same time, he did equally questionable things. He also was kind of a prick and an elitist in his own right. And he was right. kind of racist. And he was like racist. Kind of, yeah, mean, he, he was, was racist. he was like, he had this idea of being like, he, had, he was elitist. So Charles depending on which permutation, was a lot more understanding even. But with Gandhi, like even with Gandhi, he was like, I don't want to use foreign medicine. So he let his wife die of, of an illness that was curable. It's like, okay, well, who made you God? I don't understand. If anything, Gandhi seems more Magneto-like. That, or I mean, Magneto even wouldn't even let that happen, though. He wouldn't, he wouldn't deny like a loved one or his wife to not get medical treatment, I feel like. But anyway, so my point is, in terms of problematic characters, having people kind of put you on this pedestal of being, you know, great and a pacifist and all this stuff, and but still having this problematic character. So I think that that does work in that way. Cool. All right, let's keep these these answers short and sweet because we got to move on to okay. the next segments. But what are the parallels to X Men and queer identity? I read a paper on that. I yeah. know Jamie did too. Did you read that one too? Yep, I did as well. Cool. Anyway, who wants to go first? 
Well, I'll say first, really quickly, just Mary has already kind of hit upon, I think, the most explicit example, which was the one where Iceman comes out and then he's, his mom says, have you ever stud or have you ever considered not being a mutant? So I think that's like short and sweet. Right. The best example. Yep. Marius? I think that like in general, the X-Men metaphor kind of works for every group that's being discriminated mm-hmm. against, uh, but it works especially well for like the uh, the LGBT plus community. Because, I mean, it's often something that you would discover, like, in a teenage age, like, age 13 or whatever. And that's kind of, like, where mutation is kicking in in the X-Men universe. So that's definitely something uh, they have in common. Like, uh, additionally to kind of, like, the teenage struggles that adolescent people have, like, in general, that you would have to find your own identity and, you know, kind of being challenged by these questions like, who am I? What does this change about me? How does, like, the world view me? So I think that uh, it's definitely perfectly suited for for that. I couldn't agree with you more, more, Marius. I think that the fact that mutants get their mutation during times of extreme stress during adolescence Mm -hmm. and usually in these social situations i mean they're never alone right so or rarely alone and i think it's interesting that it comes out in social situations or stressful situations because like jamie and mary has pointed out it with especially with being queer it doesn't necessarily it's not it's not like a physical mutation where you see very clearly like, oh, I have horns and there's nothing I can do about that. So it's like kind of akin to a mutant who had like a psych a cycle, you know, like um tele- telekinesis, like a, this mental mutation where it's, you know, it can be very stressful and very like internal where you're just like, oh, my God, what's even happening? Yeah, I can't control it. Yeah, exactly. I can't control it. So it's really interesting that like Mary has said that it can be m- mutation can be paralleled with any discriminated group uh, what are the parallels to feminism are there any direct ones in anything that we read or anything x money that you guys have read if not no is okay i think just to start um the parallel of feminism is very can be um the same parallel that people make with the civil rights movement with malcolm x versus martin luther king i feel like there's the same because when you're talking about personal connections, I would say that I feel like there is a similar a connection I felt there with the approach amongst even like my friends with like our approach to activism, our approach to feminism, um, with some people being like, fuck it, I don't want the guys in here at all. Like they don't get this situation at all. Whereas other people I know are like really obsessed with like the integration of men and women together. And um, mm-hmm. but then some people are more concerned about other things. So I think that there is like an aspect of what part of this are you the most worried about that within feminism itself it gets an issue yep of activism is very clear awesome so in one sentence or less now that we've discussed it how does each person here define the x-men metaphor Corey. um yeah i wanted to touch go back to what we were talking about uh, when jamie brought up the x2 point this made me think of this one thing that the x-men comics do a lot when it comes to activism and gay rights is that they highlight how a lot of people blame other things for the this mm-hmm. being the way they are like bobby's parents and x2 his mom goes this is all my fault and there's a great moment when pyro says actually it's the dad that carries the x gene so it's your fault pops right and then uh recently bendis did that in uncanny x-men with gold balls gold balls goes home mm-hmm. and his mom thinks there's a demon inside of him and they start blaming all these things that they brought into their house and going to church and things like that cool nolan so um one sentence or less just as was the case in the 90s when most superpowers were figured based on genetics in the Ultimate Universe in the 60s, uh, at the time when X-Men emerged, superpowers were based on radiation, and they prefigured genetics as a major basis for all superpowers and origin aspect of superheroes. And in so doing, they provided a universal allegory for all oppressed people mm. to imagine Imagine themselves as identifying with these characters who do not have features that are looked down on by society. Well, they do, but they also have features that are envied by society as yeah. well. So mm-hmm. there are both positive and negative aspects to their uniqueness. That was a run-on sentence, but it was perfect. That's what we do. You nailed it. We yeah, yeah, yeah. Sentences. Just lots of commas. <laughs> Anybody else? He nailed it. I have like. It's a very fragmented okay, go. sentence. But I like fragments. It's like an inherent, an inherent difference, accepting it and fighting for it. That's, oh, I love that. Yeah, inherent that. difference. Because that's what genetics is. It's like an inherent difference that you can't change. 
And there are lots of aspects about people's identity that we shouldn't have to change. And it's about accepting it and fighting for it. Because I don't, that's one thing that I was, okay, no, never, let's not get in there. Okay. But yes, <laughs> period. Awesome. Anybody else? No, I'm fine. All right, cool. So Marius is going to head up the next segment, which I'm like super excited about. We're going to talk about Xavier's dream. Marius, take it away. Uh, right. So, yeah, as Justin said, we're going to take a closer look at the concept of Xavier's dream. And what we need first is like, whenever we'll be talking about Xavier's dream from now on, uh, what we need first is like a very good definition of what this dream is all about. And in order to find that definition, we all took like a closer look at a definition from an X-Men 80s classic, God Loves Man Kills by Chris Claremont, given by Cyclops during the final pages, as well as a possible definition given by Charles Xavier himself shortly before the X-Men's final battle in X-Men The End. So yeah, at first I'm going to read out both of these definitions for our listeners. So basically what Cyclops states in God Loves Man Kills is, we have unique gifts, but no more so... No more special than those granted a physician or physis physicist or philosopher or athlete. It could be due to an accident of nature or divine providence. Who's to say? Are arbitrary labels more important than the way we live our lives? What we're supposed to be more important than what we actually are? So the other definition is actually a definition from, as I said, from Charles uh, himself from X-Men The End. And what he says is, why humanity is fractured, I do not know. Why some of us have enhanced genes and others not, but that should not, must not matter. For fundamentally, we all come from the same stock. We are born on this world composed of the same raw materials as the cosmos itself, a, a potentially magnificent family of sentient beings. We fight because we must, that's a reality. But why we fight must never be forgotten. That the yearnings, the hopes that bind us together as a species are greater and more lasting than the pity conflicts that drive us apart. That we are brothers and sisters, parents and children. And ultimately, the character of a person and the deeds that flow from it must matter more than the color of their skin or the structure of their genes. So, yeah, what do you guys think has changed about the definition over the course of time? Or do you think it's been consistent? And what do we think about the way they are both being presented? Corey? I think at the end of the day, it always has been and always will be peaceful coexistence between mutants and humans. But in doing all these readings and hearing all these quotes, today's definition, we've been or the mutants have been a lot more oppressed in more drastic ways. So it almost seems like today they're more desperate, like, OK, we're still fighting. We're at war with these people now. But at the end of the day, we cannot forget because there's so much anger built up. They're losing sight of that sometimes. So Charles has to keep reminding them this is what it is and always has been. Yes. Anyone else? No one? I think that the very turn of Cyclops toward violence and non-cooperativeness is a reflection of the fact that, that A, that mutants have still not been accepted. If anything, they've been accepted less well, which is very convenient for the writers. Of course, they need them. They need to keep returning to this theme in which mutants are not accepted. And B, in the real world, many people, including African Americans, including the populations of formerly colonized regions of the world, have not been accepted any better than they were in the 60s and 70s. And that is the real issue that is being addressed here. And so to, to have Xavier finally die in a real way, not a comics way, which remains to be seen whether that's how he has truly died this time, uh, and have Scott Summers take up his mantle, which only makes sense, and have him embrace Magneto as a figure who still survives Xavier's tragic death, right? Xavier can only die tragically because his dream is so noble and so happy that it can only end in a kind of like a remembrance of positivity rather than a real substantial change. To have Scott Summers survive him and Magneto survive him and for them to both band together and realize that violence is necessary in order to convince the rich and comfortable that they must grant certain rights to the formerly oppressed. This is the real thing that's being addressed in X-Men today, in my opinion. All right. But uh, we're going to get a chance to get into that later about both Cyclops' attempt at kind of like having his own dream versus still kind of wanting to put forward the ideas that uh, Charles stood for and also into Magneto's dream, of course. So 
My next question is, can we all come to terms with one of these definitions that we just took a look at? Or does any of you have something to add about what uh, Xavier's dream means to them personally? Well, I think it's really interesting because I think maybe it's the cynic in me. I don't, I don't know. But I don't side with anyone necessarily. But it's one of those things where I just remember somebody was telling me this. I might have actually watched it on TV or something. But someone was saying that you don't even have to like each other. You just have to tolerate that things are that other people do the same like different things than you or just don't live the same way that you do. Because I think I was I thought about this when Corey said that kind of peaceful coexistence would be an ideal, which is like the best ideal that you could think of, which is, you know, necessary. We need an ideal to shoot for. But There's also something to be said about, you know, kind of being self-aware about the fact that this is an unreachable goal, but it's about trying regardless. Right. Very much like, or I mean, I guess this is a, a personal life ideology of mine, but it's, it's not about getting there. It's just, you know, it's trying to get there right? with the knowledge that you might never get there. You might not even get close, but it's about just not giving up. And I think that with violence, very similarly to like, you know, when you fight with someone that you care about and you get angry, it's a lot easier to do that because there's a clear beginning, middle and end to when you get angry or when you fight someone. And it's really easy to make yourself feel better about it by saying like, okay, well, this ended. So now we have a new thing that's going to start after that. But right. what Charles, I think, however ideal it might be, I do accept, like, I accept that he, I don't fully believe that he believed everything he said. I don't know that that's, that's kind of not nice, but he, I think that he projected it because there needed to be an ideal to reach for. And yeah, so, but he never, what bothered me was that he never acknowledged that it was like this, you know, it was so, oh, it was going to be this cyclical experience. I, it may, it, it, it sounded borderline religious to me. That's what I didn't like about it because his ideas and everything I believed in, I support it, but he made it sound like there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Like, you know, I just didn't, that's what I didn't like about his ideology. That's why, that's the only reason why I would understand Magneto's side would be a lot more attractive because it's a little bit more cut and dry and you're just like, okay, well, there's a clear beginning, middle and end there. So I'll go there. Uh, uh, we just- got to get into Sorry, Jamie. I was just no, gonna keep going. I'm keep sorry. Going. We're gonna get more into whether there's uh, possibly a light uh, at the end of a tunnel, or maybe the complete opposite of that in a minute. But first, Jamie, what did you want to add? Oh, thank you, Maris. I was just gonna say that going off of what Kay was saying, I think that one of the things I've always liked, or part of what I liked about Xavier, or maybe possibly more Scott's take on it, is the part that Kay was mentioning about, like, well, at least people are trying. And I think that that's one of the reasons why I liked the X-Men and why I think that Joss Whedon did such a good job when he did write the X-Men. Because a lot of Joss Whedon things have that humans try, and that's noble, and that's something to fight for mm -hmm. attitude. And I think that's one of the good things about the dream. And I think that's all I had, I guess. I just wanted to kind of say that, like, I th think that that... Like, say what you want about, like, how that's impossible, but there's something poetic and inspirational in the nobility of it, even if it's not quite as applicable as Magnino's dream for certain. Justin? Yeah, I want to be on Xavier's side, and I want to say I believe in peaceful coexistence. And, Kay, your answer actually brought up a lot of different emotions in me, mm -hmm. and, I, and I agree with a lot of what you said. I think what Xavier is asking for, in a way, is a transcendence of human nature, because part of me is just says it, it's it's within us not to accept each other and like you said there's other if you know we were all the same race i'm sure we'd find different other things we'd find exactly. other things to argue about we would yeah and that's why i don't like the argument of if there was no religion we would still we, there would be no war because i that's think so that, true that's so the true. john lennon argument right because I, I think that you know religion is, is a great excuse and, and it's an easy excuse and sure it might be harder to find an excuse but there are other excuses out there and mm -hmm. it, it makes me want to it makes me feel for magneto a little bit more because the bottom line is we're not all gonna or at least we haven't yet in this to, to my knowledge and history all transcended to a, a place where we can be all accepting right and, mm -hmm. and and coexist peacefully with everybody else right and when you know that there's someone who has already attacked you who has already killed your parents and your brother and your sister mm -hmm. and they keep saying we're gonna do it again we're gonna do it again and they keep trying to do it again It's, a, again, a wonderful point that was brought up in Uncanny X-Men 443 when Polaris was 
yeah. kind of levitating mm-hmm. uh, Xavier. And she's like, fight back, fight back. It's, it's, it's okay like, to fight back. And he won't. Mm-hmm. And that to me was one of his most noble moments. But I do think that, I, I don't know if I agree with that. I, you know, I think that it's okay to want to preserve yourself and, and save your family. That being said, I, I think the essence of myself would love to believe in peaceful coexistence right. and, and i do i just I, I just don't know if we can ever get there yeah okay so do you think that uh we can define like the concept of xavier's dream as a idealistic yes possibly yeah. uh unrealistic but still noble like concept of peaceful coexistence yes are you okay with that Yeah, I'm totally okay with the idea. I'm sorry, Nolan, I know that you have something to say. But I think it's totally okay that it's idealistic. If anything, it's necessary for that to be idealistic because we need to have something unattainable, especially I'm sure people can feel this way right now, like just outside of comic books, just in your own life right now in 2016, United States, it's really easy to, there, we have like anxiety disorders because we don't have enough things to attain. Like we need to keep doing things. And even in uh, the wild, you know, something that Justin was saying about how you always find difference, like even in the wild where they don't have the cognition to understand, believe systems or anything like that they will like they will isolate the weaker one because they're just like okay i can't i can't or i'm she's I'm, isolating nolan right now yeah i'm isolating like you <laughs> you isolate the weaker animal In and say case, like the drunkest yeah and you just <laughs> and you and you kill them or like you eat them or you you use them as you need. And like, you know, that's the wild. So in life, I agree. It doesn't matter if you have religion or not. There's always going to be some kind of, you know, distrust or inability to accept something else that is different from you. And I guess my I don't know how I got this hated this quickly, but I think that I don't know. OK, I'm sorry. Just Nolan, you talk because I apparently lost it. I'm sorry. We'll go back. I think Xavier is idealistic. Of course, of course, Xavier is idealistic. But Xavier's dream is more imaginable to everyday Americans, to citizens growing up in the first world who can spend more money on issues of comic books than people who are growing up elsewhere. And this, I, this I, fact sells comic books, but it also makes Xavier into, in some ways, a less idealistic figure in the most objective sense. Yes, to people who are comfortable and well-off or have the, who have at least the chance of a good life with a good job, Xavier represents a very wonderful figure who is holding out an olive branch to all the people who on whose backs the labor has existed that has made it possible for the people in the first world to enjoy the privilege that they have. But Magneto is the one who is standing up for these people who ha- on whose backs this labor has been placed. Well, actually, you saying that has reminded me... Okay coming back mentally okay but the problem that i have with charles isn't the fact that he's idealistic it's the fact that he again i said this before but he presents it in a way that's like oh this is all attainable we're all gonna get there it's gonna be great and we're gonna be like together and you know it sounds more like a motivational speaker while magneto's like no i get why that's attractive i would like that too but that's not real he likes charles you know he likes him yeah they're they're friends and they're they agree on a lot of other things but at the end of the day even magneto is just like i understand and i want to believe what you're talking about but that doesn't exist Uh, uh, but the track record of the powerful uh, when it comes to granting power to the powerless is very negligible okay well that too but also to me i guess in vain with what you're saying to me what charles is doing is being kind of like a religious figure at that point because i'm just kind of like okay well that's what most religions are like you do x y and z to attain this and you're gonna be it's like not unbelievable but just so far above you but you have to shoot for it and i feel like that's what christianity was aiming for when in in, in its inception to you well, know like be, know. to like so well we don't ago. know that yeah. but i'm just saying that like in my opinion it's just one of those things where it's like this is where you should try to be but you're never gonna get there so it's fine just try and then it got lost in subtext yeah, and, and everything. aspirational right. idealism Aspir- yes that is the you. very yes. definition of, of idealism and yet at the same time it can be idealistic to fight to the death 
It can be idealistic too, to yeah. sacrifice one's own life. Yeah. You know, so there's a there's an idealism to both sides of the Yeah, of the, that's of true. The Corey, what did you want to add? I just wanted to add that doesn't Charles kind of have to be this way? I mean, because at the end of the day, it is an unobtainable goal. Look at how look at the state of America and the world. There's still racism. There's still oppression, no matter what. And Charles knows this. But without him, there's nothing but negativity. There's he offers a glimpse of a light at the end of the tunnel, even though he knows That's it's true. not there because without him, it's Magneto's world. Yeah, it's, it's that totally negative true. world. Yeah. I'm, All right. Yeah. So <laughs> what we're going to talk next is an attempt at kind of fulfilling this very well, as we put it, idealistic concept of this dream of Xavier's and uh, setting actually an example for uh, human and mutant coexistence, but uh, most importantly, cooperation. So Uncanny Avengers uh, issue one takes place immediately after the death of Charles Xavier in Avengers vs. X-Men. And uh, yeah, first off, what did you think about the way his death is being dealt with in the issue? Considering this is, uh, that this is like by far not the first time that... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, he's bitten the dust. <laughs> I think that right. uh, it gives me hope that he may stay dead this time. Though I don't, I would be happy for Charles Xavier to come back. You know, that's not the issue. It's just that the the kind of ceremony with which they treat his death this time, and the fact that around the same time Marvel is practicing what it considers to be its own first real reboot, not counting onslaught, means that he may stay dead at least until the next real reboot. Corey, what do you think? Right. I It felt so hollow to me because it has happened so many times. And like we've read so many speeches in all these comics about Xavier's dream and what Chuck meant even though he's dead and how we have to keep going. It's just like, oh, my God, this is happening again. Like it, while it may have been a good speech, it was well, just I mean, I guess same just, old, same old. I mean, I guess just to answer that, Corey – I, I'm sure that you're you're probably more familiar with it, or most of you are probably more familiar with it than I am. But I don't see. I've only seen two, including this one, uh, two situations where Charles passes. So I don't know how redundant it might seem. But for me, it was actually. I don't know about other readers, but for me, just on a personal level, I liked it because it rode the line between being kind of careless and being too preachy, you know? So I kind of liked how they were like, yes, Charles did a lot of good things, but this is right now and we have to do this. So it was almost like they skipped the mourning process, which isn't so bad necessarily because I was like, okay, it was time for him to go, I guess. You know, like, I mean, that sounds really not like not cool to say, but I took it as very kind of graceful Without being like, oh my god, like, <laughs> I'm gonna drink myself to death now. Like, you know, it wasn't, especially in comics, like, it wasn't too dramatic. And I like that. Okay. It was very, like, boop. Okay, so, <laughs> uh, real quick answer on this one. Do you think that uh, even because some characters are going out of their way to change the way of how humans and mutants interact in this issue, I'm thinking especially of Captain America, Steve Rogers, uh, do you think that, well, this apparent death of Xavier's is kind of the beginning of a new age in the pursuit of his dream, like in this co cooperative effort? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Easy answer <Okay>. is yes. <laughs> I think the, okay. only, the answer is only yes if it's acknowledged that he was too pacifistic. Uh, otherwise, who is carrying on his dream? Well, Nightcrawler? I don't know. Maybe him. Mm, well, I mean, he could do a great job. We don't know that. Good, that's but true. <laughs> it's more that, you know, despite whatever shortcomings Charles might have had as a person, Charles was also very aware that he was going to die at some point. And right. he tried to like Corey said he tried to try to slash had to be this idealistic person in the face of all this negativity and so when he passes then his death is a symbol of you know or like a symbol of the symbol dying basically I know that that sounds stupid but you know what you know what I mean so even though it's like the upteenth death people are still like the dream is we let's not let the dream die and right. I think it matters. What do you as think? As long Justin? as he doesn't come back, it matters. Okay, so uh, real quick, we're going to get into an interesting, uh, well, I found really interesting controversy about this very book, Uncanny Avengers, because there's obviously more than one view as to how we could attain or like achieve this very utopian society that uh, Xavier's dream is uh, or should be all about. And there's like a very 
infamous speech called the M-Word speech delivered by Havok in Uncanny Avengers 5, mm-hmm. uh, in which he basically argues that the term itself, the term mutant, is uh, divisive. And this has caused like a massive amount of outrage on the internet. Uh, but we've all also been taking a look at like another really interesting position on uh, this subject by Kitty Pride, and she has a totally different view on the topic and she doesn't want to be she says that she doesn't want to be ashamed or doesn't want to hide her background so it's kind of that versus not being not wanting to be defined by your background or by uh, your genes in this case do you find both of these positions understandable do you understand the outrage uh, the internet got about the m word speech so what's kind of what's your take about uh, mutant as a possibly divisive term cory I love Havoc's speech in that issue. And I think, I mean, look throughout world history. There are so many words that get negative connotations because of what the public turns them into. And I think that's what happened with Mutant. And I think that's something that wasn't looked at in this way until it was written in the Kenny Avengers issue 5. That there was this positive word, but now there's so much tied to this one word that we almost can't say it anymore without people automatically thinking negative thoughts about it. And I love that moment in Havoc's speech when they're like, what are we supposed to call you? And he goes, how about Alex? Like, just call me my name. It was so simple but that part was so powerful Mm -hmm. just to add to that Corey, i think that i'm sure many comedians have touched upon this um this issue as well but it's it's language you know at the end of the day it's language and history obviously there's always history attached to language that's always going to happen and to you know i'm not suggesting to ever be insensitive of that history because sensitivity is definitely important but at the at the end of the day, like especially with words like mutant or, you know, the comparable words in our vernacular right now, it's interesting because at the end of the day, it's like if they have multiple meanings, it's like, okay, well, it doesn't even matter at that point because they're just words. The same way that money is paper or, you know, it's like really interesting because I'm on the fence about stuff like that because I totally understand why someone would feel outraged about that. But at the same time, from my own personal experience, I'm just like, okay, but those are just words of a person that I don't care about. So why do I care about that? And I guess that's a really selfish and self-involved way of thinking about it. But my point is, you know, language only has the power to hurt you if, like, with intent, you know? So. Right. Nolan, Van Justin? I 100% agree, Corey, not only that it makes sense that Alex would say that, but also that, of course, Alex is his own person. Alex Summers is not Cyclops. We all know yeah. if we've read the comic. He's mm-hmm. he's nothing like Mr. Sinister or his and Cyclops' father, especially mm-hmm. since they weren't even raised by him. But I do want to say that he is still defined by his status, uh, regardless of what how much he can make himself into a celebrity who participates in the contemporary digital world as someone defined on their own they would if at best he could be defined in opposition to mutant kind there's he can't really hope for anything beyond that because the this this kind of definition will stick with him no matter what he does and earlier in world history when the internet did not exist this was even more true people could not escape their stigma as members of a given group or race there's just no you can't you can't beat the information fear you know it's you you can hope to like fight back against it a little bit with your own personal charisma but that's it Mm. and alex summers is a very charismatic guy much more charismatic than cyclops but he still can't do it (laughs) he said (laughs) justly yeah i I would say i kind of see both sides of the argument in that i understand that alex needs to be seen as you know one of my favorite words a three-dimensional person and i get that he doesn't want this adjective to define him and i think nolan you brought up a really important point that alex is someone who is viewing this and operating out of the fact that cyclops is his older brother he's operating out of that shadow and it would make sense that he feels this way and conversely i feel the same way about kitty pride you know she gets called all these names she's had all these issues she told that story of when she was 13 and and you know how a boy talked about Jewish people and he didn't even understand how racist he was toward her when she revealed herself as being Jewish. So I understand the need for these adjectives to not be as emotionally charged as they are. What's the big deal with being what you are? So I I, I get both sides of the argument. And, you know, my answer is kind of that I think that there needs to be a balance and I'm not sure how to achieve it, but I just, (laughs) it's sort of just how I feel about it. Yeah. That's uh, really beautifully put, I think. Okay, so 
going away from uh, this controversy, we'll be taking a look at, well, I think we all know that one of the most essential elements in the X-Men comics is time travel, even though it's terribly, terribly overused in uh, some <laughs> X-Men comics. So an outlook into possible futures is definitely like a part of that. And taking a look at those futures can teach us a lot about what could potentially be either the right or the wrong way to go when trying to attain mutant equality. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've been taking a look at two uh, very different concepts of possible futures for this. And the first one was Days of Future Past. Um, right. And, well, we chose this because we thought that it represents pretty much like the opposite of Xavier's dream, what that would like, Xavier's nightmare, if you will. And in both the comic book and the movie, the future is sort of being averted by preventing Mystique from assassinating an important public anti-mutant figure. So what does this tell us about the kind of uh, political terrorism to achieve mutant rights? Hmm. Justin? X-Men Days of Future Past, the comic more so than the movie, if it was reprinted today, should be called What Happens When Trump and or the Conservatives Win. Hmm. Right. My only response. End podcast. <laughs> and, 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 my, and my life like, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> best thing i ever said I, I mean trump isn't just the conservatives the conservatives are fighting against letting trump he's win. not you know, anything they he's there yeah they're trying hard not to let him take over their party. he's not conservative he's not republican he's not anything he's just a child that got a hold of a microphone and a lot of money the child of a very rich man oh my god He's also like a proven reality television star. Like he knows how to get coverage. Right. But he's not care. Okay. Well, let's not. Yeah, we're gonna go there later. Sorry, we should answer uh, Marius's question better. But I kind of think of this like as that what would happen if like a Muslim political terrorist were to assassinate Ted Cruz or Donald Trump today, right now? Like, what does uh, Days of Future Past mm. kind of teach us about what that can lead to? Wow. Anybody? Well, that, that violence. Question? Or even any, well, violence as the most intense form of action, that actions have weight. I think that X-Men, especially as a series, or like especially, really touches upon how anything you say, anything you do is really important. Or like really, you know, it's really important and that you have to take it, uh, you have to take responsibility for it. And that goes with time travel because, again, with violence, like an assassination or anything like that, that's, you know, that action, just even, I don't know, I think I'm trying to like be coherent, but it just says something about how you have to be so careful about what you say and what you do to people, no matter how small or how great. And I think that it's hy hyperbolic in X-Men and time travel and when they have like a political figure assassinated and you know, obviously I'm not in politics, so I don't know. But um, but I'm just saying that, you know, just fundamentally as people, we have that responsibility to other people. And then on top of that, if you're in politics, that responsibility is a hundred times more important. So it's really interesting because like I think that the time travel element of X-Men really touches upon how you just like have to be really careful about what you say or what you do because any right. little thing could set someone off or set, like just set a completely different uh, chain of events. All right, Nolan, then Justin. Okay, I'm sorry, but I have to disagree. First, first, let me say that if you are listening to this and you are getting ready to travel through time, please do not travel through time. Just don't. <laughs> just don't do it. Do, but don't change anything. Please don't ever do it. Don't even just look or something. Okay. Secondly, if you are going to do it, then there is no possible limit to the ramifications of what you may do that i fundamentally yeah but won't there's a little about the multiverse theory won't that happen to another timeline and not ours that's true but don't fuck yeah. with the timelines those people deserve to have their own future okay just yeah, let what them, if their future is just better? let them do what they want now yeah because thirdly, you're not you don't have to be like you only are responsible for your own life you can't be that much responsible no, if for you can, a whole other storyline. If you can lines, travel through time, you. then you are responsible for a whole nother timeline. That, that's what that's, I'm... I mean, yeah. don't even... Just just don't do it. Just destroy the machine that's going to allow you to do it. Now, secondly... Yeah, but then again, what if the future of that timeline is like a genocidal... But that's always going to happen. Holocaust? 
and that's never. always if gonna happen. If you're listening to this and you're living in some like dystopian future in which like the answer to all your problems are that you must Nolan, emulate we're in the dystopian the future. Someone Claremont. who's listening is in the utopian future. <laughs> Trust me, if someone's listening to this, they are in the dystopian future. Well, I, no, I do. <laughs> I do believe that cyberpunk has accurately predicted the present in which we live. But that's not the point. The point is that if you have, if you are about to jump into some time gateway to like save your own future, I think you should probably consider some other <laughs> solution. Personally. You have to sign a waiver. But, but but all that the same, all that being what it is, what Kay said about individual agency and responsibility, I believe all that. And yet, you know. Let me let me let me raise this example. Someone tried to shoot Ronald Reagan once. They succeeded. They shot Ronald Reagan. He got a bullet in his body and a hospital took it out of his body. Who was it? What what position did they stand for? What were, what like a political movement were they advocating? Nobody knows. Does anybody know? Did any listeners of this know? They don't. So <laughs> like like there's you can you can join a movement that is successful that has some kind of like snowballing success that like needs you to help it or you can join a total dead end movement like uh if you want to if you want to assassinate president trump in the name of men's rights activism you're going to run into some problems nobody's going to give a shit you know if you want to assassinate never mind I don't think he needs okay. to We're die. We're gonna get on a watch list for this. Yeah. I just. I don't think he needs to die. I think he should just stop being taken seriously. I, I, I'm more upset at, but at, at the American people than Trump. Okay, but let's not. Anyway, Marius, yes, to hello. The Trump okay, so, oh, I, I just have a soundbite. <laughs> okay, so uh, instead of turning this into a debate about Trump, let's move on to another future. Oh, I was we so excited about at. my sound my soundbite though. Sorry, I had a soundbite. What? Give oh, him sound, his sound bite. A sound bite is like when you say something that can be is like marketable. Is that right, Jamie? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You no. My, my sound bite was how the fut- that would be the future if Trump won or conservatives won. Oh no! Well, yeah. My well, that was my my first sound bite. My second sound bite <laughs> is X Men: Days of Future Past: A Window into Hatred Unchecked. Ooh! Oh, wow! Nice. That's, That's perfect. it. Naps. Okay. I have to go jerk off to myself now. I gotta go. Ooh, I have to jerk <laughs> off to you now. Right, don't we all? Um, okay, so for those of you listening to this podcast, I hope you're in private, and that's why we put the explicit label on all of our episodes. After hours. <laughs> Love it. Okay, okay. sorry, Marius. No problem. So, uh, moving on to uh, another future we took a look at uh, in X Men The End, on the other hand, we see Kitty Pride as president of the United States. Yeah. And. She's stating that uh, Xavier's dream has finally been fulfilled. So uh, for all of that to happen, in this reality, the X-Men had to cease to exist as a superhero team. And the individual mutants had to sort of blend into society as quote-unquote normal citizens. Mm. But does this mean that uh, assimilation should be necessary for minorities in order to achieve like a peaceful coexistence? What do you think about that? And uh, does this deliver like a possible solution to the M-word controversy we talked about earlier? Corey, you go first. Thank you. I didn't like that at all. I mean, like, assimilation is, like, against everything Xavier preached, right? And we're talking about Xavier's dream right now. He's wanted a peaceful coexistence, not us or mutants becoming humans' existence, right? Yeah, right. Okay, but... um... I mean, his... uh... Coexistence as in humans don't get riots or mutants don't get riots attacking them. But other than that, what do you mean by peaceful coexistence? I mean, having to hide who they really are and who they were born to be. They weren't and hiding. Doesn't that mean with. they can work regular jobs such as yeah. president or senator or lawyer? They have to start with you? tolerance. Well, that's the thing. Like, I agree with you, Nolan, because... The reason why I really liked Kitty Pride becoming president is that her final speech even said, we still have a long way to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We still have a lot of space to grow. And I think that her that ending, to me, I loved it just because that was the most believable, ideal situation or like the most ideal, believable situation of like something that could happen in that world. Yeah, right. What, the others, what did you think about the ending in general and about Kitty as a president? She was awesome. 
I think she's a good president. I think that it's a kind of a saccharine notion of what will lead to egalitarianism between the races, if that's what mutants are meant to represent is formerly colonized races. You know, just because Obama, a man with an explicitly African right. name, has become president does not mean that African Americans are that, treated yeah, well in this country, which we all yes. know. Yep. I don't mean to preach to anybody, but it's it's it, this this issue was written when exactly? I think it's 2004. Five, something like that. Oh, yeah, so it's a very... 2008, like it's pretty something. Like that. If it's 2008, it's at the birth of the Obama campaign, maybe, like early on in it. Yeah. If mm-hmm. 2005, then before could, it. Could, true. Either way, it's that. It's a classic example of the sort of overly optimistic notion that lies behind both Xavier's dream and liberalism more generally compared to the notion that many people living in former colonies have embraced, which is that just playing along isn't going to get them an equal playing field. They must resist violently. That's Mm -hmm. the only option that they feel that they have. Wait. Okay. Mm, okay. So uh, Uh, anybody got anything else to add about that? Jamie? Uh, Yeah, just going off of that, I was going to say the one, kind of going back to the M word conversation too, and a bit of what Nolan was saying. I think it's interesting that it makes you a kind of think like what, what's necessary, like how different it's kind of like weird where it's kind of like, you're like, they're not necessarily throwing away their difference, but at the same time you're like assimilation is kind of a scary concept. Yeah. Um, like it's definitely the exact opposite of what Magneto would have wanted, but then there's a certain point where you have to question at what point do you throw out the resistance and you have to just throw yourself into acceptance and tolerance. And so I think it's important, like you guys were saying before about Kitty, noting that there's still a long way to go. Mm -hmm. But I just think that at the same time, um, what I was going to say about the M-word conversation is that the M-word conversation kind of reminded me a little bit, it was kind of like a double metaphor where it was like kind of a metaphor for any word that is used to oppress a group. It also reminded me of the conversation that happens around the word feminist. Yeah. Because it seemed like he was just saying, I feel like this word's super unproductive, so we should throw it out. But... And I see that point, but I think that's a super divisive point. And I think the idea that you should not resist by like embracing that word can also be a very dangerous idea. Yep. Yeah. So I think that Kitty, I think that the decision to at least have that happen is strong because it makes us question all those things. And I have to say, I'm not 100% certain that it's correct, but I do mm-hmm. almost always agree with Kitty. So I feel like I'm on her side. You know, it's just so interesting because uh, we actually got a chance to talk about this exact same question with Chris Claremont himself this week, who is say? writer of both Days of Future Past comic and X-Men The End. And we asked him quite a similar question and his answer was nothing less than, I mean, it was traumatic. And, oh, God. Um, <laughs> no. I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm going to crush all your dreams. I'm <gasps> going to quote him here. My vision of the story arc is a little different in what happens after X-Men The End is Days of Future Past. So there really isn't a happy ending. Kitty is overthrown as president and she's the last president of the United States because the Sentinels take over. But he also he also mm. stated that he likes to think of his characters as individuals rather than as statements of policies. So does his answer cast like a completely different light on the discussion we just had? No, no not necessarily. Okay, Nolan? It's all well and good to think that individuals do good jobs or bad jobs of, like, leading others, but history has a totally different plan for people. Rome existed as an idealistic republic for almost 200 years, and then it was subsumed under the yoke of a monarch who founded an empire that oppressed millions over the course of the next 500 years. And that could easily happen to the United States. Well, yeah, but... Everything is temporary. I like the way you said that with like your, your accent. Millions. Yeah. Repressed <laughs> millions. So you sound like a lizard. I am the lizard. Like the, like the lizard Anunnaki. Millions. <laughs> the Anunnaki. Yeah. Here, Kay, do you have something to say? Because if you don't, I'm going to No, chime jump in. in there. Okay. I was just going to say that I think that that perspective that Chris gave makes my concerns valid, <laughs> is what I would say. <laughs> Mine too. Yeah, definitely. I think mm-hmm. that like Chris himself stating that there is not a happy end to the story and that, well, he also said we kind of have to look at uh, how we get going from like the Sentinel future, what happens after that. So do you think that uh, this is casting like a really different light on Xavier's dream and whether it's uh, achievable at all? 
because X Men: The End has always been this. I I mean, for me, pretty idealistic ending and pretty well, uh, beautiful ending as well. But then again, I mean, it's all going basic, all basically all going to shit again. Well, why does it have to be the end of the story? In what way? Well, I'm just saying that, you know, I mean, I guess this kind of counteracts what I was saying about time travel, but. You know, it doesn't... Yes, so, like, what Chris was saying is valid, of course, in light of, you know, this happy ending, and then it's actually just goes to shit again. But that's everything. Everything goes to shit again, and then it gets better again. People die. the dark age. Yeah, we came out of that, too. But what I'm saying is that, like, time and life is so cyclical that it's kind of just like, yes, it will go probably go to shit again it's just about when but at the same time that doesn't mean that kitty didn't make strides or that charles xavier's dream is invalid it just means that there will be new people to want that like i don't believe in like an apocalyptic everyone is just on the same page about like nobody can be on the same page about anything so i refuse to believe that in positive or negative light that anyone can be on board with the same thing. So even with Chris Claremont's information, it doesn't deter me at all because as long as I live, X-Men will probably be around or maybe not, who knows. And it's going to go up and down just like life. And Kitty Pride is going to be president and then she's not going to be. And then something else is going to happen and maybe she will be. I was going to kind of agree. Sorry, just to (laughs) jump in with... Okay, in the sense that I don't think we really have any evidence across human history to say, oh, yeah, and then this one event happened and then the struggle was over. Mm-hmm. So I think that that cyclical thing is pretty true. I think it's like a pretty dire example of like the pushback that can happen. But I think it's always like that thing where it's like you take three steps forward and then you have to like go two steps back. Okay. So to me, I think it's actually very realistic. Yep. Okay, so very cyclical kind of take on human history, on human future. Uh, Anyone wants to argue against that? No, but I do have to kind of move us to the next segment, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. I was just going to say, if nobody has anything to add, we can wrap the segment right here. Yay! Yay. Oh, okay, cool. Let's move on to the next segment. All right, so now we're going to just take a minute and talk about Magneto's dream. We have a lot of questions set up, but we're, you know, we're running out of time. We don't want to have a, another 10 hour podcast, although some people might want another 10 hour podcast. 10 hours. In that case, Corey <laughs> says no. I agree. And if you want to spend 10 hours with us, you can go to our careers page and join our internship and you can spend days with us. And we would love that if you're cool. Anyway, okay, cool. What's Magneto's dream? Really simply, Corey, what is it? Mutant over human, homo superior. Yep. Awesome. Okay. Homo superior. Jamie. I think it's homo superior, but we have to, I think it's that, but more, I'm being really, really verbose. It's more like, it's not just going to happen overnight. You have to fight for it. Mm. A homo superior revolution. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Well said. Marius. I would actually argue against that, as in, I think that there's a really powerful scene in uh, God Loves in which we kind of get to see like a totally different vision on Magneto's dream. I mean, I think it makes sense in his head. It's not really realistic in my opinion. But what he wants is kind of like global socialism without poverty, without war, with him as like a dictator, even though he doesn't want to have it like called a dictatorship, which is understandable given his past in uh, Nazi Germany. But I think that Homo Superior is kind of like a part of that. But in his head, it's it's not even necessarily like suppressing the humans but it's he he wants to kind of like create a i mean like a great place for the entire world Mm -hmm. so it's i think his uh, vision is kind of more complex i completely agree with you marius and i think we get to see that vision in house of m because scarlet witch literally creates a world out of his vision nolan what was your answer i think yes marius it's more complex than that but i must agree with jamie that the only reason that Magneto seeks to bring humans down in his vision is that they are currently on top. His his vision isn't primarily centered around humans. He just wants to save the mutants, and that means that they must free themselves from the yoke of the humans. Mm. Right. All right. So it's very obviously, it's very different than Xavier's dream. 
there's a mutant rule, although, you know, not maybe not punishment to humans, but we definitely see in House of M that humans are not treated on the same level as mutants and people with powers are, are sort of treated better. There's so much we could go into and Marius, you wrote down some like really awesome stuff. I would love to talk about how he blew up Genosha and also I, I think it's an important point to bring out how many of the characters say that his dream has failed, but since we're running out of time, we're going to have to move into the alternative dreams as well and to the next segment. And so Cyclops, which we talked about the Avengers at the end of Avengers vs. X-Men, kills Professor Xavier. So spoiler alert, if you're living in 2011, Marius, why don't you take over the segment about Cyclops and Corey, I know you're a big Cyclops fan, so I know you'll enjoy a lot of these questions and answers. Okay. I, only, I only wish I had my Cyclops glasses with me. Oh, my God. I literally thought Cyclops was here last time. <laughs> I was like, where the f- <laughs> fuck am I? Where I, I was transported to Earth 616 and when Cyclops was near me. Okay, so real quick about Cyclops. In the case of Cyclops, there have been like many years or even decades in which his dreams seem to be identical to that of his mentor. Uh, as we've seen uh, with his definition in God Lost Man Kills. So uh, we're going to take a look especially at uh, the post-AVX uh, Cyclops and his mutant revolution and from how that was depicted in Uncanny X-Men Volume 3, Number 1, which, I mean, do you think him and Xavier could still find some kind of common ground or has he long become like the new Magneto I think it's very unfair to call him the new Magneto. Mm-hmm. I think he still carries through Xavier's dream. He just never settled and he constantly took strides and made choices that maybe Xavier wouldn't have made. Mm. He took he took action and yes, yeah, some of them may have been negative, but he, he'll even say this. Like, I did what I thought was right and I did what I had to do for the dream. Right. Agreed. Okay, so um, I think in order to answer this question, like, even a bit more precisely, even though I, I'm really happy about your answer, and I think we all are. Uh, I think we could take a look back at Avengers vs. X-Men 6, in which Cyclops and uh, his Phoenix 5 are basically... I mean, they're trying to end wars, poverty, etc. on the entire planet, and it's kind of working. Mm-hmm. So uh, Xavier just doesn't quite seem to be like 100% satisfied with that, and he seems to have his doubts about uh, Cyclops' methods. And uh, Scott still argues that he's given Charles his dream. I mean, how far are they really a party, like, ideologically? Just to clarify, this is the utopian storyline, yeah, right? right? Yeah, It's like uh, Utopia basically in the middle of the uh, uh, Avengers vs. X-Men right, story right, arc right. after they acquired, like, the, the Phoenix powers. Yeah. Jamie? Yeah, I was going to say, I think that the, the satisfaction comes from, there's a point, I think it's in the... God loves, man kills. Second where Magneto's talking about how he's like, you don't really understand my dream. It's really not quite the level you think it is. It's more like we have to take power to like force this to happen. And so I think that Xavier does not believe in that at all. So I think that's one of the reasons why the Phoenix Force doesn't, like the idea it doesn't work for him because he wants it to kind of be like a natural understanding of coming to. And I mm-hmm. think he feels like it's that Magneto idea of like taking force right. and kind of like pushing everyone into a new ideology and I don't think that he believes that's a really an authentic effective way exactly right Justin I, I think it is reminiscent to me of the Buffy spinoff Angel in season four with Jasmine because here you have a character who wants to make world peace but they want to make world peace in their image mm. and I think when you talk about the Phoenix five these are five individuals and power this kind of power to this these few people can be very dangerous and the reality is that what they consider utopia is not what everybody else considers utopia. And I think it's a dangerous and slippery slope to put five people in charge of creating a world that they believe is a utopia. Right. True. Okay. So jumping back to Cyclops's mutant revolution, in my opinion, both Wolverine and the X-Men 40 and uncanny X-Men volume three 32 in which he has ideological discussions with Emma, but also with Alex and Logan. They kind of give us like a better understanding of his motives and aims when it comes to the revolution, but also when it comes to like honoring what Xavier did uh, before his death. So what did you think about that, about his motives, about uh, his revolution in hindsight? Justin? If you want a revolution, Cyclops thinks you have to fight for it. And I think that's where he's at odds with Xavier. And personally, I am a little bit more behind Cyclops and Xavier because Xavier seems to believe that in the back of his mind, but he acts differently. And Cyclops is out in the open with it. And I appreciate Mm -hmm. that. Corey? 
I just want to touch on a moment in that issue of Wolverine and the X-Men that I think is really underrated. And I think Cyclops' greatest faults and weakness is highlighted when Wolverine says, you need to learn to hate yourself a little bit. Yes. Cyclops is unable, because I like you know this, I love Cyclops. He's probably my favorite character. But he is unable to take a step back and look at the bigger picture of what he is doing outside of what he feels is right. Mm. And Wolverine really nails that. But on the other hand, I think that Cyclops during his mutant revolution might have like a lot of self-doubts and might also like be thinking to himself or be saying to himself, yeah, you can't, you're kind of doing this out of desperation, aren't you? And mm. Kay, I think you've hinted at something like that in uh, one of the previous segments. Yeah, well, I think that with Cyclops, he gets, it's interesting because he does take a different path than Charles, but at the same time, he falls into the same trap I guess, of leadership in general, which is like, I have to put a brave face on even though I'm doubtful of all these things that are happening and like having moments of reflection, like Cyclops does have moments of being self self aware and having doubts, but he knows that he has to or like, you know, Charles is is one of his greatest influences. So of course, he's gonna mirror what he does. And in doing that, he kind of hides this doubtful part of himself in creating this revolution and Wolverine who is you know I don't want to say the polar opposite because he's not really but Wolverine who's very not even dismissive but kind of just complacent in what he is or has a lot of convictions about where he's going in life or where he's not going in life rather like he's just like my story doesn't have a happy ending I figured that out a while ago I've lived for much longer than you you know I've already figured it out and like like Scott, you just need to learn to hate yourself more. And I don't know where I was going with that. (laughs) Okay. But I think it is valid that Scott does have the self-awareness. It's just that he doesn't, sometimes he doesn't allow himself to have it because he's a leader. All right. So really quick answer from each of you. Uncanny X-Men 600, redemption for Cyclops, realignment with Xavier's dream, yes or no? Oh, can I answer? Go. Yeah, sure. I don't think you can ever come back from killing somebody. Yep. But I do think... You didn't kill him. The Dark Phoenix yeah, did, is did. that what you're saying? No, Cyclops didn't kill him. He wasn't in his right mind. Uh, that's Non-cubic what they all say. Cubic Crime mental. of passion and all that I shit. Mean, hey, Jean Grey was forgiven. I don't understand why Cyclops... I don't forgive her. I think, she's, I think she's bullshit, too. Oh, yeah. Who did she kill? She didn't kill anybody. She forgave, though. like... She, she killed the whole, whole planet. planet. That wasn't really her, though. Oh, that was the Phoenix. Oh, what? Listen, yo, the greatest war heroes have killed just as many people as the worst. I don't like, care for killers. war heroes either. Just, anyway, so you are a pacifist. My soundbite no. for this is, can't come back from it, but there is a sense of redemption for me because, I don't know, I thought it was a great moment. I never thought that he really needed redemption, but I don't agree with what he does, but let him live. I think he did fu- fuck Cyclops. He only got interesting in this newest shit. That's agreed. Actually, that's, yeah, agree. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> under the, uh, out from under the shadow of Xavier, that's where Cyclops gets interesting. All right. Any Cyclops so. defenders can jump in at any moment, even though we weren't a... really shitting on him, really. She means Corey. <laughs> yeah. Corey and Marius. <laughs> yeah, I kind of think that, like, after everything is done, like especially with with his mutant revolution that seemed extremely militant but also extremely desperate for mm-hmm. some people watching and that made him kind of like the public face of like the evil mutant the terrorist mutant after all he's done i think that this really symbolic act like of gathering like the entirety of uh, mutant kind in front of like the lincoln memorial just saying mm-hmm. okay right here we are here's like every mutant in existence so what nothing's happening it's not like we're trying to uh like overthrow humankind but it's he not was like, for a second basically okay. it's not like i'm the new magneto and, no, and then uh, he attacks the inhumans yeah that's what I, yeah. and then magneto comes down and he's like hey i feel yeah, you should be a part of this magneto he's just following yeah, in charles right. footsteps that's why i don't but that's that's kind of what what i why i think that this is kind of like a realignment with xavier's dream I mean, right, uh, right, right, right. I think I'm with his, you, Mary. His, I'm yeah, with yeah, you. yeah, yeah, yeah. Was pretty much in line with with Xavier's dream, but like with other methods that are mm-hmm. kind of more fitting to like this new, I mean, this new age, I guess. Mm. But 
then again, I think that like the symbolic act has something like much more peaceful about it, much more like trying to set an example into the world. And that's kind of what uh, Xavier would have been into. Yeah. So I totally agree with Magneto that he's lost his mind, but uh, Xavier would have loved that. Right. That's, yeah. Uh, words he used i guess and then again of course he attacks the inhumans and dies in the terrigen mists but i don't think we i don't think we should get too much into that because we don't really, <laughs> we don't really know what happened we don't game. know what happened yet yes, and marvel so. doesn't want us to know what happened well, yeah. all right so we could talk about number frost the hellfire club yeah. how you know they believe in mutant rule through conspiracy behind the scenes maneuvering blah 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 business business all this other stuff really interesting but we don't have time we'll let you think about that for yourselves audience which is why you Someone gave you a brain, biology, Darwin. Speaking of Darwin, we're going to talk about Apocalypse. Nice. Apocalypse is a Darwinist uh. who believes in survival of the fittest. So why do we mm. as a society consider this wrong? Can someone tell me why is Apocalypse wrong if, if the universe has dictated that this is the way that these are the universe's laws? The Corey universe and Marius. That. Oh, and Darwin Jamie. Who, after. Oh, just kidding. Jamie first. Sorry, That's there's that. a lag. Oh, does Corey agree with me? He pointed at me like he was agreeing with yeah. me. Yeah, you, ha you have a good point. I wasn't going to say that, but you have a good point. That's okay. They probably couldn't hear you. Uh, Jamie, go. I just said that the universe didn't dictate that. Darwin dictated yep. that. Yup. Yup. Not even Darwin. It was his interpreters. Uh, Mar okay, well, yeah. That same. Okay. Who was it? Corey Marius? Sure. Uh, yeah, Corey. Corey. I just wanted to say that it's kind of bullshit because everybody's dealt a different hand. You know? I mean, that's True. as simple as it is. Right. Yeah. We could have been born beavers. Oh, it could be 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 That's Bieber, Bieber and up in we could have been bouncing our Bieber. I would have preferred it. All right, so <laughs> here's my favorite segment, but I'm going to cut a lot of this. Let's just go really quick. <laughs> Who are we? Oh, Marius, you had something to add. Add, add it. Uh, yeah, I wanted to add that. I think it's. I, I'm not sure if I know the correct like English philosophy term, but I think it's called the naturalistic fallacy, like saying mm. that something is necessarily like morally true or morally like important just because it takes place in nature and i think it's really dangerous to uh, go on that road because well basically you can justify whatever you want you can justify gang rape basically and uh, i think we all agree that uh, gang rape is definitely something morally questionable and so i think that the main reason why Dar not darwin him himself but social darwinists are wrong is that well compassion and like looking out for reducing the suffering of sentient beings and trying to attain the most, I don't know, the most good in the world as possible. And social Darwinism is uh, pretty much like the opposite of that. Yep. So, I agreed. I think Darwinism just denies people of the cognition that we have been given. If there is someone alien or not alien that comes along that has a higher cognition, that's a whole other thing. But as of right now, what we understand is what humans understand. So we might as well have that set of rules to go by instead of being like, oh, you know what, though? Let's just rape each other for the <laughs> sake of bettering the species because that's what animals are doing. They just yeah, right. don't, And we have the cognition and emotional cognition exactly like, you know the cognition to reflect and think about that and you know plan ahead so it yeah agreed cool all right let's get to this exciting real world applications type thing who are real life purifiers marius uh oh i'm sorry i was i was gonna say who's uh, like a, a real life darwinist i'm sorry oh Just i would say who, who is a real life darwinist hitler oh okay good good uh also probably nietzsche even though it's kind Yeesh. of controversial. Interesting. So. I guess so. Uh, well, okay, that sounds whatever. intellectual. That's Too interesting. Yeah. I yeah. don't know if I agree with that, but let's not. Me neither. Okay. All right, cool. Who are real life purifiers? King Jong Un? Or maybe Kim Jong Il more so than his son, but he's gone now, so it kind of doesn't matter. Marius. I feel like real life purifiers are the people that uh, hold up signs that say, uh, God hates facts. That's kind of like the, the real life. South Borough Baptist Church, right? Uh, yep. Nolan. Uh, that guy who shot a bunch of bullets out his window at a mosque recently is a real life purifier. And all that yeah. happened as a result of it was that the mosque embraced him and invited him to join their congregation. And he did. And he like had a tearful TV interview about it. Oh, my it. God. So that's real life purification. Jesus. I would say anybody who uses Christianity as a justification to oppress. Yep. 
Yes, I would say, or any religion. And I would say uh, probably Donald Trump if he had actual power. Yep. And then that – I don't know if you guys remember this, but you remember that guy who – he lived in California and he posted a video on the internet about how like women were the problem and he hated them and they never gave him what he wants and they never wanted to with him. And then he went around on a gun rampage. Well, uh, yeah, he was trying to purify. Oh, the guy who like killed a bunch of women at an exercise facility in Pennsylvania? I mean, thank goodness he did it. Was it was in California. Right? Oh yeah, about ten. Oh, but ago, which man are we talking that. about? Because yeah. there's so many it men who can't which handle being to, rejected. To the, so let's just woman. shoot up everything. So true. Um, They'll purify the human race by making all assholes. Are we the Only purifiers men. to those people? No, no. I don't think so either. So this could be a podcast in itself, but I just want to go around to each person. What role do you think religion plays, if any, in the pursuit of otherization? What is other? Oh, like. Othering another per- Okay, okay. Yes. Gotcha. Marius. Well, I kind of think like we've touched upon this already in the podcast. Like if there was no religion, it's not like that would solve these kind of problems. But then again, I think religion makes it kind of, I mean, kind of easy to mm-hmm. like point a finger on something that's, I mean, quote unquote, like what God wants or what God hates. Like you got these two characters of absolute good and absolute evil and it's just so easy to align like a group to one of them and say yeah this is good this is evil you have to hate this group of people i uh, I agree i think that people just just human beings in general are like a flawed you know necessarily necessarily flawed species and it's one of those things where religion itself isn't bad conceptually at all conceptually it's amazing but the fact is you know, you see it in children, like early as children, where they other people because it gives them strength, you know, and they'll just say like, oh, well, I did my homework, but Charlie didn't. And it's like, who the f- <laughs> gives a shit? Well, you know, but like at the same time, like, but at the same Kay's time, like, mother. But, that's a, but at the same time, like that is a real thing. Like, that's how you define yourself. Like, that's how you learn. And it's interesting because that stuff continues to be an issue and then religion gives probably too much leeway for people like that to be like oh well i did this to grant you know to grant my way into heaven but you fucked up when you did this charlie bit me uh jamie (laughs) thank you for that nolan I was going to say that I think um, kind of going along with what Kay was saying, religion kind of gives you an excuse sometimes to be more superior than other people. And I think it's some it's a kind of like religion is very contradictory in the sense that the first half of it is like you need to be a good person that's accepting of all. And then the second half of it says, but also know that these people are good and you want to be like the good people and you don't want to be like a bad person. Mm-hmm. So in, while it's trying to tell you to love and support Everyone at the same time, the system is built in a way that implies some people are better than other people based on what they do or maybe things they can't control. So I think like Kay saying, like, we all have these problems, but religion definitely gives a really good excuse to other or judge someone else. Corey. I just wanted to say that I think, in my opinion, I think it's interesting that uh, religion played more of a part in otherization in the past and today. Not that otherization has gotten better, but as our culture strays away from religion, there are other things that, get, that contribute to that. Religion is yeah. still there, but I think religion totally. is more of the root of the problem. Mm-hmm. Mm. And I just want to point out that it's interesting that this graphic novel is called X-Men God Loves, Man Kills. Mm-hmm. And I think that goes very well with what we're all saying. Really quick, I know this is kind of off topic. We're probably the only people who are ever going to discuss X-Men She Lies with Angels and the Chuck Austin run on the oh podcast. My God. From now forever. In one word or two words, can we just like say what we thought? Cheesy. Uh, cheesy. Jamie? Yeah, I was just going to say that. I was going to say my only love for my only hate. <laughs> that was <one> of the <laughs> original lines. Uh, Corey? I was going to say hammy, like an 80s movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Marius, what about you? Yes. Cheesy? Jesus um, I, I actually want to like just quote something from oh, the comic no. book. Let me just. I mean, how can I go this way when my heart has gone back that way? <laughs> just so it's just so poetic. It's beyond poetic. No, that's true. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. I mean, you delivered it beautifully, and yeah. it's also like literally, how can you? Because you'd be how dead. Can you can't. You? Yes. Yes. Like you can't. Just pointing that out there, that Nolan. What did you concern. think? That was shit. You thought it was shit. Oh damn, I, I that's aggressive. It just—it's it, just having like so many 
Romeo and Juliet kind of analogies in it is just too obvious. Well, it was very obvious. As a person who just hosted a Guilty Pleasures podcast, I did take a lot of pleasure in the Romeo and Juliet plotline of that story. I, I take a lot of pleasure. Okay, in two points. Number one, my favorite part is when Warren and Paige have sex in the sky, nude. And yeah. I like that. That I was, yes. that was, that that was, was cool with. Awkward. You know what that's called? Last Monday for me. My nice. other, Are you the mother? <laughs> I, I, I would be one of his feathers. I would also like to point out did I cry at the end? Yes. Why? Because I like cheesy things, and I don't really watch chick flicks, but I do like chick comics, and I think this was kind of one. I may have teared, and I think I like sang the song in the head, like in, in the head. I heard his in voice. my head, it was right? Beautiful in my head. I know it was beautiful in my head as well, but I was also like, "This is so fucking cheesy." And then at the end, as I was tearing up, I was like, "Justin, you have really poor taste." And then the crying became worse and worse. And then, well, I was um, really patronizing about it. I was like, yeah. "Y'all are eighteen. You don't know shit." No, I, I, that's like that Rihanna song where she's like, "He might as well take a gun and put it to his head." It's like, no, lady, you are. F- 16 years old if he he, he will get the f- <laughs> over it don't kill him write him a note set him up on a date after i mean he's he'll be fine he'll be fine you do you Corey. i just wanted to say i couldn't even read that final song i just i just I know the comic i couldn't do anymore it only for me i was Aww. like who sings this hinder like this is awful be i like, heard like yeah. a bad <laughs> Is oh, no, I heard about it. I heard that's about it. I, heard it. I don't know. I don't know Hinder either. I'll be honest. But it was. What is it? <laughs> I really um, want to hear your voice. So, Say so my so name is so, so, so like Nickelback's so new I kind of, I kind of felt it. like who's it? Rob, the guy who was uh, oh, Rob Thomas. Know. I had that song yeah, on my iPod. Rob, Rob Thomas. Thomas. Rob, Rob Thomas, Thomas yeah. meets Nickelback. Yes. Can we discuss how whenever the two lovers first like see each other backstage, they like begin a trope that continues for the next five issues where they like are always like arching their backs and their lips are about to touch and they're like saying like long paragraph sentences. I was like, like girl, yeah. I wish I looked like that when I was 18. Are you shitting me? Like, uh, f- they're like always they're always like a few centimeters away from kissing at all times. Like that's how much love they feel. The best and, was the grandma. I- I yeah. want you to wake up. That's the most beautiful I thing I've ever heard. No, I know. I was, I, they were ignoring you for a good like twenty minutes. It you was a bitch. very sexual, intimate combo too. It was. It like, was. I would yeah. Die no. for you. And then Grandma's like, "Sign me up." I know. <laughs> <laughs> she was so into it. She would have left like instead in an alternate timeline. She did. So, exactly. And she lies with angels. I think Julia Cabot is the daughter. <laughs> she has a great monologue where she says that hating mutants is an excuse to turn yep. inner pain into anger and focus it on someone other than yourself. An excuse for those whose own inadequacies are so immense that they can only feel less deficient by dominating others who must be categorized as beneath them. Yep. Naturally, I thought about the way Muslims are thought of in the United States and mm-hmm. much of the Western world. I mean, there's a lot of Islamophobia in Europe, with all due respect to my fellow European, Europeans, and I'm sure uh, Marius would agree with that. Donald Trump supporters, and I'm, you know, I'm just repeating what they said, I'm, although I'm very against them. I'm just saying what, what he said and what his supporters seem to think um, is that they want Muslims banned from coming to the United States completely. Ted Cruz has called for them being their neighborhoods in the United States, Americans being patrolled by the police. And Trump has also said that we should have a database of all Muslim people in America. In this real world example, does everyone who wants that fall into what Julia Cabot is discussing in the quote I referenced? Corey. I just want to say, yes, I am from a very rural part of a Midwestern society, and there is that way of thinking everywhere, and that is exactly what it is. And I'd say, as someone who's like a lifelong East Coaster and New Yorker, we're kind of like, you guys are be okay. Like, no one's going to go after Akron. No one's going to blow up Akron. Like, they're going to blow up New York, and we kind of don't want these wars and, and all this mm-hmm. shit. You know what I'm saying? That's kind of like our East Coast elitist mentality, but I do get that people are scared. And, I, and you know, there is a sense of patriotism that comes when, you know, you are attacked. Jamie? Yeah, I'm going to say, as a person also from, I'm from Oklahoma, so I think that, yes, there is that ideology rampant, and I think... And, but at the same time, just going off what you were saying about the East Coast and the New York centrist, like, like there was a bombing of Oklahoma City. Like, it's like, there was. like you, like you never, you never know when people are just going to go off the rails. And I think, especially like with Oklahoma, that's one of the things people always say for like why they're scared. But I think it's like just that thing where when people are scared, they do things that you don't expect. Like, you never know what right. people are going to do until you corner them and yep. you terrify them. And most people, I think, just feel safer knowing that they have force or power. On their totally. side. Although I will argue that in Timothy McVeigh's case, our rights and 
private liberties were not being taken away from us, that people understood it was a lone mm-hmm. wolf and we didn't attack a group of people after that. And we didn't even have a mental health issue. We were just kind of like, wow, what a tragedy. And yeah. it's a shame we don't look at other things more open-mindedly. Does anyone have, else have anything to add about this? Nope. Okay, cool. Moving on. Is Julia Cabot's father and she lies with angels a satirical villain or is there a realist element to him? Or, or is he merely totally an real. Totally real? Totally, totally real. real. So there are real life. I would feel dazzling. like he was more real than what Charles Xavier's character was representing. Like so much more real. Amen. Anybody else? I just, I do think that like where he's coming from, like his rage is pretty real. But then again, I don't think like in a real life scenario that he would like slap his daughter with his uh, gigantic Iron Man suit. Uh, like, mm, mm. I just don't, I just don't see that happening. But I apart do. from that, I don't know. Well, Interesting I thoughts though. Yeah. So we gave, or I gave the Hellfire Club some lip service earlier talking about how they're kind of maneuvering things behind the scenes. I thought of the Koch brothers. I thought of the banking system. I thought of Wall Street. Does anyone else have any real life parallels for the Hellfire Club and the kind of world domination that they want to get behind the scenes? Corey. I just recently read this book. I have it right here. It's called Them, Adventures with Extremists. It's about this journalist that follows this conspiracy theory all the way around the world that says that there's an elitist group of people that run the world behind the scenes. And I think I thought of the Hellfire Club when I was reading that. I thought it was really interesting. You should check out The Biggest Secret by David Icke. I'm not condoning it. I thought it was an interesting read in my early 20s. He's a a, a character in this book. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Anybody else? No lawn. I think there's no such thing as lizard people, but yes, I'm uh, with you. There is such a thing as the one percent. There are people who look like lizard people, though, but they're not yes, actually. Yes, uh, right. I agree with that. The yeah. people, yeah, the people who own the most property tend to be kind of old and maybe have like sort of like pointy noses and like they're at, yeah, they have like they have like flaky Jewish skin because they don't moisturize as much. Of, maybe that too. They're just old. You I know? think that's all. I think that they're like they're like rolling around in their money, and it makes them their skin dry. They're swimming through it like it was like like, like, like iguanodons or right? something, you know. Yeah. Okay, so I thought that was interesting. What about real life cyclopses? What about real life apocalypses? Uh, Marius, you brought up one earlier. Yeah. Again, I think that uh, Hitler is like uh, as close as as it gets to a real life apocalypse. I... I can't think of any Cyclopses. That's what I'm having a hard time thinking of, too. A real-life Cyclops? I mean, I don't know if I agree with him. But I, I, well, I, Firemen? I, mean, I, I look at his tactics. <laughs> <laughs> Firemen? I think you can look at some of the... Hmm. The American Revolutionaries? Was Samuel Adams a real-life uh, Cyclops? A Cyclops would be able to talk to the younger demographic without seeming I like was going to say Obama. But I, I was thinking that. T- I wanted to say that, <sighs> too, but American I wasn't examples. sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cyclops so wishes good. he was Obama. Yeah, I can. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Obama maybe. is more like a cleaned up gambit hmm. without a pass. Uh, no. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Remember my Jamaican gambit? Yes. Was, yeah, I, I do. It was, I, I feel like wait. Obama's not conflicted enough to yeah. be Cyclops. I don't know. No, I'm kind of I feel there. like he's caught between activism and being the man. So, you know what? Mm-hmm. Now that we have 163 people listening to our podcast, mm-hmm. can one of you please send us a, an email or leave us a comment and let us know? We're what talking you think about is a real some... life Cyclops or Apocalypse. Yeah, we're talking about some really controversial shit in here. Yeah. Right? We need opinions. All right. So, last question, and Marius mm-hmm. is going to be a little bit different for you because there is a European dream, there is an Australian dream. I have no, not read the analogous dreams for Asia, but is either Xavier or Magneto's dream or anyone else's dream that we discussed, Apocalypse, the Hellfire Club, and Frost, are these dreams rooted in the American dream and or European dream? Marius, go. Well, from a European perspective and from someone who's kind of, I mean, dealt with the American dream on, I don't know, maybe a too superficial level in school. I don't think so. I I wouldn't say so because I think uh, what the American dream includes like the pursuit of happiness but also kind of like a libertarian approach like wanting to be kind of free of government kind of uh, self-determined i think it's 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 just kind of more to that than like just equality and happiness i i think it's more i think it's uh, more politically like what's the word charged i was just gonna yeah say that, charged yeah. Precise. Determined. I would say it's, it's like more precise and it goes into kind of yeah. a different direction. I would agree. I think that the American dream is so specific and I don't know if any of the dreams that we've discussed today could really be pigeonholed in that. Uh, Corey, Jamie, and then Nolan? To me, the American dream is simply that anything is possible. If you work hard enough, you can be happy in the pursuit of happiness and all that. So on that basic level, somewhat 
Charles's dream is that if you if we work hard, we'll have this happiness and peaceful coexistence. That's on a very like very light level. I don't think there's any similarity to any of the things we've talked about. Jaime? I think that the Hellfire Club is definitely a manifestation of the American dream in the sense that it's like the complete highest toppest tier of achievement. And then I would say that I think Magneto's dream is probably also closer to the American dream just because it has a little bit of a superiority slant to it, kind of like a pull yourself up, like fight for it like slant. And I would actually say that I think Charles's dream is less because I think a lot of the American dream is about like – I don't, I guess it depends on how cynical you're being. I say a lot of the American dream is based on finding really hard to be the best. And if you, if you interpret that as the best you can be, then I would say Charles' dream is yes. But if you interpret that to be the best, then that's like the opposite of Charles' dream. I think that first of all, Charles's dream is very American. He's a very American version of Gandhi. Martin Luther King might be the most apt comparison to him of the entire podcast. Secondly, Magneto's dream is also very American in that what we imagine his resistant terrorist activities to be are like taking over New York or like working from his meteorite uh, in rotation around the earth to attack the United States. You know what I mean? So it's very America centric. But both of them reflect this kind of naive sense of the American dream that is instilled in us in public school, which is essentially that you can be whatever you want, which is just simply untrue because society is powerful. We cannot just choose anything we want. So a much more realistic dream might be a European dream. To truly imagine Magneto as Hitler would be a much more European dream. I mean, that's some real shit. He tried to take over the whole world. You know? Yeah. But he did. I'm going to kind of go with Corey on this one, and I'm actually going to side on a patriotic and or ethnocentric note, depending on how you want to look at this. One of my favorite quotes ever about America and the American dream is from George Washington, and it was a letter to the Jews of Rhode Island. And I always kept this. I found it in two seconds because it was in my Chrome bookmarks from many, many years ago. And I am definitely i'm not paraphrasing but i'm sort of chopping it up here but george washington says to the jews for happily the government of the united states which gives to bigotry no sanction to persecution no assistance requires only that they who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens and i think that i want that to be the american dream whether it is or not and i think that that very much fits into xavier's dream so unless anyone has a retort to that which i can think of many myself i think we're going to end there and i just wanted to say thank you guys so much every single one of you for sharing in my birthday with this this is the, the one of the best birthdays i've ever had one of the best conversations i've oh. ever had i feel very confident about the podcast Stop. no i'm serious so thank you guys all so much for being here anybody have any last words about anything we're talking about we talked about some heavy stuff happy birthday Thank you so, so much. I appreciate it. I love you. Thank Never you. stop too, fighting. Darling. And we fight all love Justin. Mi- fight the power. Agreed. Amen. I, I consider myself I a real-life Lockheed. I just want to say that. <laughs> yes, you're my Lockheed. It's so kitty. cute. Right. Or I, I would be like a real... What, what are, What's like Nightcrawler's little like brother called? Like the little... The little bath. Yeah, who is that the guy? Oh, Pickles. I would be a real life Pickles. Oh, <laughs> I like that. I'd just be like Bamf and like shitting all over Bamf. the place and be like, sorry. <laughs> um, I just took a shit there. All right. What a beautiful note to end. This is the first podcast that we've gone without talking about things like anal and all this other stuff, but I had to work it in It's there. not too late. So we got it's it not there. too late, right? I just had to say the word. All right. Thank you guys seriously so much for being here. Thank you for your last thank words. Thank you, Justin. Thank you so much for everyone listening. You. If you got this far, consider yourself a real life. Cyclops slash Mother Teresa mm-hmm. and I had some issues too but that's for another podcast as always you can find us on comicsfirst.com we've got videos we've got more podcasts we've got articles we've got swimsuit calendars featuring the men of comics first mm-hmm. I'm mm-hmm. actually on every every single page so it's actually just Ooh, featuring me yeah. and you can I'll actually pay you twelve ninety nine just to, to get it I'll, I'll, if you want mm. it I'll give you twelve ninety nine. right Always giving back. I'm ordering that shit right now. Right. Anyway, I'm not like as Cleopatra once said to Mark Anthony. I am not above prostituting myself for my country, Mm. and I am not above prostituting myself for about a thousand hits per podcast. Word. All right. I love you all. And prostitution school. All right. Love you all. Just kidding. All right. Have a good one. I'm a prostitute. We're all prostitutes, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Bye, guys. Prostitutes in my heart.